from his studios in New York. It's time for Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. Here's your host, Dan Tortora. Welcome here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Proud to be here with you every single Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. This week, we're broadcasting live from the BK, live from Brooklyn, New York, and we're doing an extra show. So we will be with you tomorrow, Saturday, March 10th. So don't forget to wake up on Saturday and listen to the show at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, because we will be on on Saturday as well. So got a nice little bonus show for you this week. It's been amazing. We've had so many different guests on the show this week, as we always do during Championship Week. I want to give a shout-out and a thank you to everybody that's been a part of the show on Tuesday's broadcast. Down here. That's when we started down here in Brooklyn. I want to thank Dale Shackelford, Roosevelt Bowie Jr., Mike Wheeler as his team heads to the NJCAA National Tournament, and, of course, Utica Pete's Company for Ingredients to Success on Wednesday, March 7th. Jerome Robinson and Kai Bowman of Boston College, Josh Akogi and Todrick Jackson of Georgia Tech, Rex Fluger, Bonzi Colson, Matt Farrell of Notre Dame, and then Marek Dolajai, Frank Howard, O'Shea Brissett, and Alan Griffin of Syracuse, along with Syracuse Orange men's basketball alum Gene Waldron, Lawrence Moten, and Ryan Blackwell. Then on yesterday's show, Thursday, March 8th, I want to thank Ray Spaulding and Dwayne Sutton of Louisville, Terrence Mann of Florida State, Alric Freeman of NC State, Jerome Robinson, Kai Bowman of BC again, uh, Notre Dame's TJ Gibbs Jr. and Rex Fluger, Justin Bibbs of Virginia Tech, and Pascal Chuku, uh, O'Shea Brissett, Matthew Moyer, Barama Sidibe, Frank Howard, and Tyus Battle of Syracuse, and then Syracuse Orange Men's Basketball alum Craig Forth and Daywan Coleman. Through the Looking Glass proudly brought to you by Looking Glass Events, an event planning company in in central and upstate New York that you need to call at 315-702-4653 for your event. And, of course, Ryan Hall from the Syracuse Silver Knights. So, you have all made the show amazing. You made it a ton of fun for me. We've had a phenomenal week down here, and it's only going to get better. We have plenty of interviews coming up today and our signature segments as well. So let's get in to the morning menu. Here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We like to start off the show by giving you our menu of topics. The morning menu, that is, live now with the morning menu is Dan Tortora. The morning menu here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora for today's show. We'll start off like we always start off a Friday show. We'll have the annoying moment of the week proudly brought to you by Carvel DeWitt in just a moment. We've changed the name of our soundbite segment. It's no longer Soundbites of the Week. It's now called Significant Soundbites. And Significant Soundbites will start off at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time with John Swafford in my extensive conversation with the Commissioner of the Atlantic Coast Conference sitting down with me and discussing different topics like challenges today of being a commissioner, what's been going on with Louisville, Miami, Duke, Syracuse, so on, and North Carolina, so on and so forth, and how to navigate when you're schools that are your institutions that are under your conference when something goes on with them how do you handle that how do you adjust how do you tackle it as a commissioner the one and done rule and adam silver of the nba the commissioner there just what he thinks about what the nba can do as well as autonomy and being one of the autonomous five the acc is with the pac-12 the the sec the big 12 and the big 10 what does that mean for the future of collegiate athletics as well as what does John Swafford think about Brooklyn and the chances of returning to New York and just what the ACC tournament will look like in the future as they are here this year in Brooklyn. They've been here two years in a row. Next year in 2019, they'll be in Charlotte. 
And in 2020, they will be back in Greensboro. So just his thoughts about that and so much more. So John Swafford's going to have a conversation with me about numerous things. And these are big, big topics that connect ACC to you and connect all of collegiate athletics to you. So it's it's not just about the ACC. It's about a little bit of everything. And John Swafford provides a phenomenal, very open conversation with me about so many different topics in collegiate athletics so make sure you're listening to significant sound bites with john swafford and myself at 9 30 a.m eastern time today and at 10 a.m to start off the second hour of the show i'll be joined by terrence roberts syracuse orange men's basketball alum you know how we do it here on wake of call with dan satora every single live broadcast on location during championship week features a former syracuse basketball player so like I said, on Tuesday we had Dale Shackelford, Roosevelt Bowie Jr. On Wednesday we had Gene Waldron, Lawrence Moten, and Ryan Blackwell. On Thursday we had Awan Coleman and Craig Forth join the show for the first time ever. Today we'll have Terrence Roberts, and on Saturday, March 10th, we'll be joined by Sonny Spira and Hal Cohen. So a lot coming up here and always creating something here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. And one of those things is giving the Syracuse fans their Syracuse Orange men's basketball alum. Win, lose, or draw for Syracuse, the alum, come to Wake Up Call. And I want to thank each and every single one of them that's been on the broadcast for all that they have done. And I want to uh, truly send you an appreciation. Also coming up on the show, we're going to have Virginia's DeAndre Hunter, Devin Hall, Mamadi Diakit, and, uh, and we will also have... Clemson's Mark Donnell, Elijah Thomas, Kai Bowman, and Jerome, Jerome Robinson will join me from Boston College again for the trifecta. They were on Wednesday show, Thursday show, and they'll be on today's show. Gary Trent Jr. from Duke will be joining me. Lonnie Walker the fourth, and Chris Likes from Miami, and Joel Berry the second from North Carolina. One-on-one -on -one interviews between myself and those gentlemen all joining this show in the second hour right after Terrence Roberts. So, jam-packed show here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. So let's get started with the annoying moments of the week right here on Wake Up Call. Dan Tortora proudly brings you... Is that for real? Are you kidding me? The annoying moment of the week. I, I really honest, I don't know how to respond to this. Presented by Carvel DeWitt, 4322 East Genesee Street. It's what happy tastes like. Do you have to be that crazy? I guess so. The annoying moment of the week for this week, folks. <laughs> It has to do with apps. It has to do with apps. And I've just gotten to a point where we need to discuss it. You know, I think I've discussed it a little bit here on the show. And we're going to do a little bit more now. So the annoying moment of the week for this week proudly brought to you by Carvel DeWitt. It is what happy tastes like. Get yourself some Carvel DeWitt on 4322 East Genesee Street in DeWitt, New York. Folks, don't let the cold weather fool you. Weather is weather in central New York. The consistent every single season from autumn to winter to spring to summer is Carvel DeWitt, the longest standing Carvel franchise in America and the exclusive home of the wake-up call Sunday chocolate vanilla, vanilla or a twist topped off with cookie dough pieces and caramel swirl. It is my spin on which, I mean, it's my spin on the treat, right? Everybody needs a treat. It's my spin on it. So if you want less calories per ounce as well, you can go to Carvel and get the Carvel Light. So make sure you go over there and do that and do it today. So go get a wake-up call signature Sunday and think of me because I can't have one right now because I'm out of town. So, so go enjoy it. And when I get home, I'm going to get me some. So you can be sure of that. So make sure you get over to Carvel DeWitt and show them some love. And I definitely appreciate everybody for what they do. So thank you so much for uh, for everything over at over at Carvel DeWitt for all the work that you put in and just just the kindness 
the hospitality and all that they do there. They really do a phenomenal job. So give credit where credit is due, right? And they definitely deserve some credit. So some love over there to Carvel DeWitt, who has been with me for the annoying moment of the week for nine years and counting. Nine years and counting. So let's get into the annoying moment of the week. My annoying moment of the week this week is dating apps. Dating apps. That's my annoying moment of the week. Why? Why dating apps? Okay? Because dating, whatever happened to chivalry, whatever happened to going up to somebody that you don't know in a place that you're not familiar with, and you say, hi, or maybe you are familiar, like you're in the mall, right? You're walking through the mall, and you see a girl walk by, and you're like, wow, she's pretty. I'm going to walk up to her and see if she has a boyfriend. So you walk up to her and you say, hi, miss. You don't know me. I don't know you. But I saw you walk by. I couldn't help but come over and say hello. I'm Dan. She gives you her name. You talk for a little bit. She laughs. You laugh. You walk away and say, hey, before I leave, could I get your number? Could we go out sometime? And she either says yes or no. Well, now, there's none of that. There's no chivalry. There's no, do I like you? There's no, do you have a personality? It's, I'm going to turn on this app, and I'm either going to swipe right or swipe left. If I swipe left, you're ugly. I don't like it. You're nasty. And if I swipe right, it's like, well, I think I want to have some type of sexual relation with you today. I don't know you. I don't know anything about you. But I think that, we we should bond in the most intimate way that humans find a way to bond physically. It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Back in the day, I had to fight, right? You had to fight for the phone number. And, the, and it was always the man. It was always the man. 99.9% .9 of the time, it was the man coming up to you saying, Hi, miss, you don't know me. I don't know you. But can I have a minute of your time, please? The dating world has totally changed. And that's why it's the annoying moment of the week because we talk about not being connected as a society. And we talk about being emotionally detached and, and not caring about our neighbor. Well, I mean, what, what embodies that more than having an app that says, I want to have sex with you, I don't want to have sex with you. I want to have sex with you, I don't want to have sex with you. I want to have sex with you, I want to have sex with you. I want to have sex with you, I want to have sex with you. Oh my gosh, I will never have sex with you. Well, maybe I'll have sex with you. I don't know. Because if I see her again, maybe I'll... This is insane. I know people that have used these apps before, and they said that they, the, they go to the person's house, the person opens the door, they say, how was your day? And then there's the sexual inter relation. <laughs> it's a family show, so I'm trying to find a nice way to put it forward. But I don't get it. And somebody said because it was like National Women's Day and International Women's Day and, and you know, and, and, and this, that, and the other, they said that Bumble which is the app where the woman has to be the first to instigate conversation. It's kind of like a Sadie Hawkins dance. They said that they something about Bumble, there was like some, some ad or something about Bumble, how it celebrates women's rights. That like Bumble is supposed to empower women because the women get to choose if they're going to have sex with a man instead of the man. I mean, I was like, what the, like, what is this? How does that celebrate women? It's degrading to everybody. Hey, if you're on Bumble, and I think you're attractive, and you think I'm attractive, you have to, as the woman, say hi to me first. That is women's rights. That's like the most bigoted thing I've ever heard. That's not women's rights. That's not women's rights at all. Women's rights. You think about it. Rosa Parks and the creator of Bumble. Are they the same person? I dare to think no. Are they a relation? I dare to think no. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just, I look at, like, women. Amelia Earhart, Bumble. Really? Really? That's, like, Oprah Winfrey coming from nada, Bumble. No. Absolutely not. So, yeah, that's the annoying moment of the week. Because we're supposed to be celebrating women, and there's an there, there there's a notion out there that, that the Bumble app celebrates women because they get because they have to instigate conversation, so they have all the power on whether or not they have sex with a stranger. That's what women's rights is. I can choose whether or not I want to have sex with a stranger. You know what? I can choose whether or not I want to have sex with a stranger. Do I have women's rights now? I mean, I don't. Uh, 
I don't get it. Don't degrade women. Don't degrade women's rights. And for men and women, get off these apps and have a conversation with somebody. Dating has literally succumbed to, I'm going to have sex with this stranger in 15 minutes. I hope they don't have herpes. I, I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I don't get it. I don't understand. And you can't make me understand. I love when people are like, no, Dan, see, you just, you just don't get it. You know, it's really like, if you break it down, it makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make any sense. I am so happy that I met my wife. You know, I met my wife at work. I spoke with her. I got to know her. She had a boyfriend at the time. I was like, damn, this sucks. I waited. I believed that I was going to get an opportunity. I got an opportunity after they broke up. I was respectful. I wasn't kissing this girl, holding her hand, this, that, and the other thing. I don't disrespect like that. And then all of a sudden, I got a shot. I take the shot, and now we're married. Okay? That's what happened with us. That's what happened with Kate and I. I didn't go on an app and say, would you like to have sex with me, stranger? And she was like, sure, why not? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, that's not how our relationship blossomed. But, I mean, for some people, maybe that works. For some people, maybe that's the thing. I don't know. But for me, what has dating become? What has dating become? I mean, it's essentially this, like, grotesque, creepy... I see. I saw you in the hallway, and I thought that you were cute. I mean, it's just like very disturbing now, and it's really funny. As uh, it's just it's it's hysterical to me that dating now is it has nothing to do with being nervous, right? Sweaty palms. You're going up to a total stranger, and you have to say, Hi, I think that you're attractive. Would you like to go out with me? And then they're like, uh, no. And then, or they're like, yeah. You know what I mean? It's either like a yay or like a heavy nay. And you never know what you're going to get. Now, you don't have to worry about any of that. Do you want to have sex? Sure. <laughs> Do you want to have sex? Not today. Had a lot of it yesterday. Not so much today. I mean, it's it. We have succumbed ourselves as a society to being, to priding ourselves on being emotionally detached. And these websites are hoping that you're emotionally detached. They're like begging you to be emotionally detached. It's like, hey, do you not care about other people but just want to have some type of sexual relation? Well, then we're the place for you. And if you want to be a woman who's empowered, we're Bumble. Come to see. I mean, I'm not trying to like knock Bumble. It could be anybody. You know, but to say that a woman's app where a woman has to instigate whether or not she's going to talk to you after she swipes right or left on you. I mean, if she swipes right on you and you swipe right on her, she gets to instigate first. You can't say anything to her first. And that's women's rights. No, that's not. Not at all. What did Ectocore say? And now you send her to buy pizza for you so you could stay home and play with your friends. Yeah. Right. Right. But the thing is, I mean, one, one of my buddies is, is dating right now, and he said to me, Dan, he's like, you do not, you do not want to miss this world. I was like, I don't. I don't miss the dating world. Dating world is a pain in the butt. It was so hard. It was so hard. It's not easy for the man. Man's got to do all the work 99.9% .9 of the time of, like, going up to the girl, getting the phone number. She's just looking at you. You know, but think about the things that go on now. And people are like, well, dating's so much easier now. Now I can just be like, you have blonde hair and blue eyes. I like blonde hair, blue eyed people. You know, it's like, this is Hitler running this app. I mean, I, I just, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't get it. I really don't. Dating has essentially become, I'm getting an Uber. I'm checking my Facebook status. And I'm getting myself a woman for the night. I mean, it's kind of like prostitution. Is it not? Dating has essentially become like prostitution. Hey, I think you and I would be good for this one night stand. I'll swipe right. I hope you do too. Text me. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. 
It's crazy. Where's the chivalry? Where's the holding the door? Where's all the awkwardness? Where's like waiting until the third date to get a kiss? Now it's like the first 15 minutes you're in bed with the person. I mean, this, this is not, this is not normal society and it's made us even more. So we're a want it now society. And this has made people even worse when they want something right now. I want it right now. Give it to me right now. I mean, I mean, you see that? People that are complaining about standing in line for food. Oh, my God. Why do I have to wait for this? Nobody's forcing you with a gun to your head to wait in line. Get out of line. See you later. Bye. Go get something else. Why are you mad? Why are you mad at the success of a restaurant? Why do I have to make reservations? Why can't I just go? Because uh, they're good. Uh, because they do a good job. One of the top restaurants in the country. Maybe that's why you got to wait. Too bad, so sad. What do you want to do? It's how it is. You know? Ugh. Why do so many people want to go to this concert? I can't find any good tickets. I'm going to write a nasty thing to the amphitheater, and I'm going to write a nasty note about the band. Why? What did the amphitheater do? What did the band do? The band's successful. The amphitheater booked them. What's your problem? I want it now, Dan. I want it right now. Dan, I don't want to go to college. I just want to have a million dollars. I think everybody would love that. You got to work hard for it. I don't want to work hard. Why can't I just sit at home and have somebody else work for me? Because that's not how life works. But these apps, that's what they do. These apps teach you as a young child to be superficial. To only judge a book by its cover. And to get a lady or a man for the night like you would go get a cheeseburger at a drive through You're essentially going through a menu, selecting what you want for dinner, and getting it. That's what dating has become. I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I'm going to throw up. I am. It's crazy. So, for the annoying moment of the week, we always try to spin you positive so what would I like you to do? Here's something fun. If you're single, and I don't care who you like, men, women, whatever. Whatever gender floats your boat, I want you to take a step back today. And the next person that you see that you feel like you want to go up and talk to, I want you to not think about being physical with that person. I want you to go up to that person. I want you to say hello. I want you to strike up a conversation. I want your personality and their personality to have a moment together. And then decide if you want to go have dinner. That's what I want. That's what I want for you. Because Tinder girl ain't wifey. Okay? And the guy... That you find on Bumble at 3 a.m. <laughs> that's not the father of your children. More than likely. Could be the father of your children. But more like a baby daddy and not a husband. So. Be smart. Be kind. And can we please start to actually like interact with each other like normal people do. God didn't intend the world to be swipe right, swipe left. He didn't intend for any of that. Like I said, it's like going to a drive through looking at the menu and going, I want the fish sandwich today. Maybe tomorrow I'll have chicken. But I heard they have good burgers. I'm going to swipe right on this quarter pounder. I'm going to swipe left on this chicken sandwich. That's what we're doing in dating right now. Mm, hard pass. Ooh, she's nice. Why isn't she writing me back? It's very creepy. It's very creepy. You think it's creepy to go up to somebody that's a total stranger and introduce yourself? And then, you know, here's the other thing, too. When people are like, I have a boyfriend. I have a girlfriend. Oh, my God, leave me alone. We get it. You want to be left alone, this, that, and the other thing. It is so hard to date, though. We don't know if you... And the thing is, people say they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend when they don't. And people don't say they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife when they do. Just tell the truth. That's why dating's so hard. 
You go date somebody, you hang out with them for a few weeks, you find out that not only does she have a boyfriend, but she has a child. And you go, why weren't these things important? And then what is what does the other person say? Well, you didn't ask. I'm sorry, I didn't know that that question was on the table. <laughs> what do you mean I didn't ask? You didn't ask. That's insane. Oh, I'm a serial killer, but you didn't talk to me about it, so I figured I didn't have to let you know. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate it. Didn't know I was dating Charles Manson. Happy day. <laughs> it's like, what? Dating is so, so difficult, and I don't envy anybody that's doing it. So, but we need to change it. I'm sorry, folks. We need to go back to the otter, awkward, sweaty palm going up to a total stranger and being a nice person and saying hello. We have to go back to that. Or else all hope is lost. I could tell you right now that if I was single, mom and dad would not be proud if I was swiping right and swiping left. That would not be something that, that they were hoping for their child when I was a little boy growing up. I hope that our son founds a nice girl on an app on his phone at 1 a.m. And then another one the next day, and then another one the next day, and then goes to a checkup at the doctor, and everything's a-okay. That's what we want for our son. You know, all these values that we brought him up and all these ideals, none of those things matter as long as he can find what he likes on the menu when he's dining in. Ectocore said, it's the idea of learning how to communicate with our mouths and not our thumbs. Yeah, it's very true. Now, I'm an internet-based radio show and so much more. You know, the company itself, Dan Tortora Broadcast Media, LLC. But I call it hand-to-hand -hand combat. As much as I'm on the internet, I'm walking and talking and giving out my business card and saying hi to people and interacting with people all the time. All the time. All the time. Because I care. And I want to get to know you. So as much as I'm an internet-based radio show, I'm not all thumbs. And, and I'm telling you right now, I would not use any social media if not for my show. If not for my work, I wouldn't use it. I use it for work. That's what I use it for. I use it to spread positivity, to give some advice to myself and others on how to take care of yourself because I feel like everybody needs a happy note. And there's never too many happy notes that you can have. I love when somebody's like, you love me too much or there's too much, there's too much love or too much caring or too much positivity. If you're dating somebody that tells you that you care about them too much or you love them too much or you have a friend like that, there's something broken inside of that person. And you need to pray for that person. Because if you send me love upon love upon love, I'm not going to look up at God and go, oh my God, send it back. It's too much. I got too many flowers today. I got too much money in my bank account. I have too many people that are writing positive messages to me, and I'm just inundated with it, and I am over it. I am up to here with all this positivity, need some negativity in my life. If you meet somebody like that, pray that they find some Jesus. I will never complain about blessings on blessings on blessings. And who would in their right mind? We need to communicate with our mouths and not our thumbs. You're absolutely right, Ecto Cores, because we have become a society that sits at our desk and talks to the world and then gets up and goes to a grocery store and can't even look anybody in the eye. We're better than that. I'm better than that. Hope to Jesus you are. Let's get it. We'll take a step aside here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Coming up here in the morning menu of Friday, March 9th, I will be joined by the commissioner from down here at the ACC tournament in Brooklyn for, an, for a huge, huge conversation on so many different topics. You don't want to miss it. If we did five minutes... This would be a great conversation to listen to. If we did one topic, it would be a great conversation to listen to. We blew the doors open on this thing, and we're going to be talking about a lot of different things coming up in just a moment after this fast break. Thanks to Carvel DeWitt and Carvel Ice Cream for the annoying moment of the week. 4322 East Genesee Street in DeWitt, New York. Don't let the cold weather fool you. And we had some, I heard the weather's very nice in central New York right now. Get yourself over 
to Carvel to win. I know it was sunny and 40 yesterday, which is like 90 for us at this time of year. So go and get yourself some Carvel DeWitt today. No matter what the weather is, make sure that you treat yourself and treat the family with Carvel DeWitt. 4322 East Genesee Street in DeWitt, New York. And the Wake Up Call Sunday with cookie dough pieces and caramel swirl on top. Please go get one for me today as I'm jonesing for it. We'll take a step aside and come back with John Swafford, the commissioner of the Atlantic Coast Conference. This is a Wake Up Call Fast Break. Carvel DeWitt, it's what happy tastes like. Do you know why? Because we make ice cream. Creamy, rich, flavorful ice cream. Not yogurt or ice milk like some of our competitors. Ice cream. Fresh, by hand, daily. For the calorie conscious, we have something new for you. Our new Carvelite. Same great flavor, creaminess, and texture of our regular ice cream with only 35 calories an ounce. So whether you want an ice cream cake, a flying saucer, dasher, carvelanche, hard or soft ice cream, we will satisfy your craving with our fresh, handmade, regular, or new Carvelite ice cream. Carvel DeWitt. It's what happy tastes like. Clothing that will change with you without you having to change. DrysigLady.com, D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G, Lady.com. With the bamboo line, relaxed fit clothing, as well as the athletic fit clothing, DrysigLady.com is fit for any woman, any time of the day, anywhere. Whatever you're doing, whatever your day commands of you, Command yourself to feel comfortable in Dreisig Lady Apparel. D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G Lady.com. For all the women out there, feel good in what you're wearing. And don't feel like you have to constantly change throughout the day. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, a business owner, going for a jog, going for a meeting, or just relaxing at home, DrysigLady.com is the right fit for you. D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G Lady dot com This is Lawrence Papaleo, licensed real estate salesperson for Gilbo Realty. Call our home office at 315-752-9513 or better yet, call or text me directly at 315-748-2524. Let me ask you a question, Lawrence. If I needed you to help me buy a house, find the right place, could you help me do that? Joe, I'll help you find your dream home. You don't ever say my name on the radio, never. If I needed to sell a house, could you help me go about that the right way? Yes, yes I can. How do they get a hold of you? Call me directly at 315-748-2524. But you also do the commercial property. So if I got a business, couple businesses, got to take one here, move it over there, do this, do that. Are you going to help me buy and sell my commercial property also? Yes, sir. I like that. I like that. What's my name again? I have no idea. Absolutely. But they need to know your name. So give it one more time. This is Lawrence Papaleo, licensed real estate salesperson for Gilbo Realty. My phone number is 315-748-2524. Why don't you tell him your name one more time and that number so we can jot it down. This is Lawrence Papaleo. Call me or text me directly at 315-748-2524. Honey Waters Kitchen and Bar is your home on the water for every season. Join them on Wednesdays for all-you-can-eat wings, chicken thighs, and drumsticks from 3 to 9 p.m. And on Thursdays, join me, Dan Tortora, for live game show night. A new night out unlike anything you've played before in central and upstate New York every Thursday at 7 p.m. And while you're there on Thursdays at Muddy Waters Kitchen and Bar from 5 to 9 p.m., join them for the barbecue all-you-can-eat buffet with buffet-style sides, ribs, and pulled pork chicken thighs and drumsticks and on wednesdays and thursdays all day happy hour you know how to get it done right at muddy waters kitchen and bar on two oswego street in baldwinsville new york where i wanted to get started was for you i know you get you get asked a lot of questions about a lot of different things and just kind of what you could say about the challenges of being a commissioner in today's world are in your opinion well, I think the challenges of being a commissioner, first of all, are, are, are always about building consensus because, uh, and particularly the larger your league is, you know, we've gone from a nine-member league to 12 to, to now 15, yeah. and uh, and it's been terrific, and, and it, it gives us all kinds of opportunities that we did not have as a nine-member league or even a 12-member league and, and puts us in a position of strength. 
uh, but it also is that many more people that you need to bring together because one of the keys to being a great conference is the ability to sit in a conference room and have the leadership from each of, in our case, 15 schools uh, make decisions that are in the best interest of the whole not necessarily just in the best interest of one or two institutions and uh, our league has had a uh, uh, tremendous culture in my opinion of, of, of having trust in each other and, and an ability to to make decisions that are in the best interest of, uh, of the whole and uh, you know that's continued fortunately but uh, but I think the consensus building is the is the biggest challenge and uh, and there and the other parts of it I think are adjusting uh, and understanding that that the world changes and uh, uh, while you don't want to change your 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 principles so to speak and and your priorities and and what you're fundamentally about yeah. uh, I think you need to maintain those principles but at the same time uh, adjust to a changing world whether it be social media or uh, technological aspects of it the change in the television market uh, uh, all of those things come come into play when you look at like you said uh, wanting to look for the consensus and and to have all 15 schools feel like they're a part of something tobacco road and you know charlotte area as well as you know greens row and whatnot to have the ACC tournament there, it works for the Clemsons and the NC States and, you know, Virginia Techs of Virginia and North Carolina and Duke and so on and so forth. But to have it in Brooklyn, you look at some of the schools you brought in over the last few years where it helps Pittsburgh, it helps Syracuse, Louisville, Notre Dame and whatnot. You know that you're not going to be here in, you know, the foreseeable future. Just what you could say about spending a couple of years in Brooklyn, what that did for the teams you brought in, and if you sit down with the 15 schools and look at schools like Syracuse and Pittsburgh and, and BC and so on and so forth and say to them, we would like to come back to the Northeast and give opportunities in the future for the tournament. Well, I, first of all, I, I think the rotation our tournament has had over the last uh, – four or five years it has been a very very good one that has served our conference well uh, where we've been we were in North Carolina then Washington then here in New York for, for two years yep. uh, and then we'll be back in North Carolina for two years and uh, I've been really pleased with that rotation I, I and I, I, my, I think we'll probably uh, while it's premature to, to say so based on the early discussions that we've had uh, of extending the rotation. I, I, I suspect what we announce going forward will be something similar uh, as we move along because uh, it, it, we've had a great experience here in New York. I think it's been tremendous for all of our schools, uh, yeah. actually. Yeah. And uh, we need to be here, and, and we'll need to be here in the future. And, and, I, and I would fully expect us to. Uh, I also think we need to pay attention to the uh, you know where the roots of the league began, and 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 uh, where the tournament became great, which was in the state of North Carolina. Uh, but that North Carolina, Washington, New York uh, rotation has been very, very good to us. Uh, so we'll see what we do in the future. But I, I would suspect it would be something similar. Uh, to what we've done in our most recent uh, rotation and, and that we're in the middle of where we go back to North Carolina the last two years. I, I sort of uh, uh, liken it to uh, the catchphrase of respect the past and, and embrace the future. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, with our 15 schools, uh, you, you obviously have a lot of the schools that uh, – formed the Atlantic Coast Conference and have never been in any other conference but the Atlantic Coast Conference. Yeah. And there's great history and tradition there and, and a tremendous tournament that was built over a long period of time and has been a great one for a long time that had most of its history in North Carolina. And then you've got some tremendous programs uh, that have come out of the Big East that are now part of the Atlantic Coast Conference. And that tradition and history tournament-wise has been in New York, yeah. and it's a great, it's a great thing. I mean, you know, I, don't, I think it's fair to say that for years, uh, the two best conferences in college basketball and the two best conference tournaments in college basketball were the ACCs and the Big East, 
and uh, and now a lot of us are together in the ACC. Yeah. So I think we need to respect both traditions and histories there. And then in terms of embracing the future, we're 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 a different league now. We're we're 15. Yeah. We go, you know, from uh, Boston to Miami, the entire Eastern Seaboard. Uh, and we need to recognize that as well and take advantage of the opportunities that that, that gives us because it's a, it's a gives us tremendous strength and, and a lot of opportunities that that the ACC never had before as a nine member league uh, and, and nor did the members of the Big East uh, uh, because it was more regional so uh, you know I think we've got got a great thing going and, and, and I would I would see us keeping it going. And when you look at, you know, where you're at, you'll be 2019 in Charlotte, 2020 back in Greensboro. How, when you said you're in these current discussions, how many years are you trying to plan out? When you look at this D.C., New York, Carolina discussion, are you trying to kind of sit down and say, let's plan out the next six years or the next ten years? How, how are you looking at things right now? I don't think it'll be as far out as, as we've done sometimes in the past. There was a time not too long ago where we actually did a ten-year rotation. Yeah, uh, we won't do that, and uh, you know we may try to look at things where we're staying maybe five years out. So uh, you know we've got we've got two left after this. I would see us maybe adding two, maybe adding three. I don't think it'll be any more than that this spring. Yeah, and and then <clears throat> you know after another year or two, then we look at it again. And, and, and tack on to the back end of things when we've got several left. Yeah. So sort of keeping it in that five-year range is probably what we'll do. And when you look at, you know, at the conference itself, with everything that's going on when I had spoken with you just a few minutes ago about the challenges of being a commissioner right now, with everything, be it coming out with Miami, North Carolina, Louisville, Duke, Syracuse, so on and so forth, more than 20 schools named with the FBI probe and that are inside, the majority of them inside of the Power Five. Just how you tackle that and how you handle that because the FBI has to do their job, the NCAA has to do their job, but you're the guy that's going up having to answer questions and people want to know what your thoughts are and how you're going to handle it in the future. Just how you tackle that because we don't see the days that you spend and the nights that you spend in your office sitting at the desk trying to figure out how you're going to tackle something. So just what you can say about the background of it all and and how you try to present this conference moving forward knowing that people have questions. Well, you know, that that's an important part part of it without question, Dan, and it's it's a, a part of it where you're where you need to work with um, obviously others in similar positions. Um, of leadership at, at the other conferences, and because we we, we have to do this together, uh, and we also need to be working with uh, the people that are at the grassroots level in college basketball, for instance, in, in USA basketball. Uh, the things that happen before these players even get to to us at, yeah. at the collegiate level, and then those beyond the collegiate level in the NBA and, and uh, the NBA Players Association that impact us as well. So we're not only impacted by uh, our own rules and, and uh, the, the things we pass from the legislative standpoint and the concepts we put forward, we're affected by uh, the things that are done before they get to us and the things that are uh, done <laughs> after they leave us. Uh, right. And, and I don't think we can continue to operate as silos. Uh, you know, there's got to be a better connectedness there, and there's a lot of effort that goes into that. But uh, the thing you don't want is, you know, anytime you hear an FBI investigation connected to college basketball, that's exactly what you do not want to hear. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously there's some systemic things in college basketball that need to be changed. Uh, I think we need to look at that very, very carefully. Uh, you don't want to have just a knee-jerk rea reaction that you don't understand the unintended consequences of the changes that you make. But obviously there need to be some changes, uh, both changes that we can control and some changes we can't control, but, we, but hopefully we can influence to make the whole uh, 
you know, period of time from when a young person is, is just beginning to be a quality player, yeah. you know, at the grassroots level to when that person enters the NBA and, and, uh, and, and, and plays on a professional level. Uh, so a lot, a lot goes into that as well, and hopefully, you know, I, I think this is an opportunity for us in college basketball to, uh, to figure out what changes can be made that that makes the world uh, a, a better place for, first of all, for the for the young men that are playing the game, and uh, and, and then for the you know, the whole global sense of, of the game itself. Yeah. And I think we've made some progress with that. I think there are a lot of things that are being discussed right now, not necessarily publicly. You can't necessarily solve all this publicly. People, a lot of people have opinions on, on what to do. Uh, but the real hard work, I think, gets done behind the scenes and, and uh, out of the bright lights. And, but hopefully uh, when that time comes, the spring, summer, so forth, There'll be some concepts <clears throat> that come forward that can can make us all better. When you look at changes that need to be made, what are some of the things that come to mind? I know you've spoken about Adam Silver and, and the one and done rule and kind of his take on it, your thoughts on it, how there's some parallels there. What are some of the changes that are on your mind to say some are in, some are in your control, some are not, but hopefully you can influence them. What are some of those things? Well, the one that's not in our control is the one and done. I, I think we're in the worst place we could be in in college athletics uh, with the NBA's one and done rule. Uh, I'd much rather see something like the baseball rule or the, or the football rule or even the hockey rule uh, where a player can go out of high school and go professionally. Uh, but if they, do, they don't, they, they go to college, then, you know, they, they wait three years. Uh, it, could even, it could be two years, but one year is the worst. That, I'd rather not have any. I, I just let them go out of high school uh, because I think that forces some kids into the collegiate system that are, are really not very interested in, in, uh, in higher education, and that's okay. Uh, higher education isn't for everybody. Yeah. It, it may be better for, I mean, Kobe Bryant did a wonderful job of, you know, skipping college, going straight to the NBA, and look at the career he had. Now, he's an extraordinary example. There aren't a whole lot of those, but there are some. Yeah. And uh, if they had that opportunity, and, and uh, then, you know, I think that's fine. I don't think that damages college basketball one bit, personally. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to see the one and done rule you know, done away with. Uh, even if it is simply, you know, you can't go, you can go after high school or you can go anytime else. I, I think that's better than what we have right now. Even though, from my perspective, I'd rather, <laughs> rather it be the baseball world. Uh, so that's one. What, what we do during the summer is another in terms of the, 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 the camps and the opportunity for kids to be seen yeah. and therefore recruited and where can our coaches go, when can they go there, and who controls those camps. Uh, I, I think we may need to take more control of we, you know, collegiate athletics, and maybe it's in partnership with the NBA, maybe it's in partnership with the shoe companies, but... Uh, you know, I think I think a different approach needs to take place there, and uh, so those would be would be two right off the bat. A third, in my opinion, is that we, we uh, I think we need to modernize uh, our agent rules, uh, and by that I mean liberalize them some. Uh, I think we've got some rigid rules right now that. Uh, you know, don't really matter in the whole scheme of things, and I think we need to give our players the opportunity to, to get the right kind of advice uh, at various times in, in their collegiate career without without losing their eligibility, yeah. and uh, and that may mean you know giving them the opportunity to do some things and <clears throat> with agents. Uh, that gives them more of an opportunity to get the kind of information they should have and get it from the right kind of people instead of the wrong kind of people. And um, even to the point of possibly, you know, being going into the draft, maybe they're not drafted, let them come back as a possibility. You know, yeah. now, I'm not quite there yet, but, you know, I think we need to really step, step back 
and take a look at, at, uh, at, at real change that can better the, the system, better the process, uh, better the opportunities for, for our players. Uh, and to understand if we went in this direction or that direction or what the unintended consequences would be because that, that can be the killer is when you don't see the unintended consequences. So uh, th this is an opportunity to, uh, to do that. When you look at, like you said, uh, having some opportunities to make some changes and do certain things and a former partnership with the NBA potentially and with the shoe companies and whatnot, you look at the autonomous five that you're a part of with the ACC, Pac-12 as well, the SEC, the Big Ten, and the Big 12. With that legal side of things and with the autonomy, do you look at something like this and, and the FBI probe and what's going on with the NCAA and ever think to yourself as a commissioner to sit down with the other commissioners of the Autonomous Five and say, maybe we need to form our own separate group that is just the five of us and that we don't function completely under the NCAA anymore. I mean, is there a thought of maybe we can handle it better, maybe we need to just wipe the slate clean and, and start a new chapter? Do you ever look at something like that? Well, I, I think that's that's been lurking in in the in the back, <laughs> you know, the, the, the background uh, for for a while. I, I don't think we're there yet, uh, and and uh, I think the the adjustment in the NCAA structure uh, four years ago, five years ago that brought us autonomy, gave us the opportunity to, to really make some headway in some things, such as full cost of attendance, uh, four-year scholarships, uh, stronger uh, insurance programs for our athletes. Uh, at the, at the, uh, the Power Five level, if you're the Autonomy Five level, if you will. The, the challenge in basketball is, is, is trying to be uh, you know, trying to be fair to some of the really outstanding basketball programs that are out there that are not part of the Power Five conferences. Uh, you know, there's a pretty distinct separation uh, in the sport of football uh, for, for, for a lot of reasons. Basketball, it's not, you don't quite have that same kind of distinction. I mean, you know, what... Villanova is a great example. I mean, it's one of the outstanding basketball programs in the country. What, what happens to a Villanova if the Power Five goes off? You know, yeah. except just breaking it down, and there are others, you know, I, yeah. uh, that would fall into a similar category. Villanova is the most obvious, I guess, right now because of their current success. Yeah. Uh, as well as past success. I mean, that, that's not recent by any means. Uh, so basketball is a different animal than uh, in football, uh, and you'd have other examples in, in other sports as well. So uh, I don't think any of us take lightly the, the thought of uh, going off in, in our own direction. I'm not saying that someday that maybe that happens, but I certainly I do not think that's imminent. Uh, coming from John Swafford, and John, uh, outside of all of this, I want to do something really quick with you on the show that I call Rapid Fire to get to know you a little bit better. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions that have nothing to do with sports. Are you ready to play? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Favorite movie of all time? Uh, Casablanca. If anybody could play you in a movie, what actor would you want to play you? Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite song of all time? Oh. Uh, Good morning, Starshine. Favorite band? Chicago. If you weren't a commissioner, what would you be doing right now? I'd be a writer. For what? Uh, I don't know, but I'd be by a beach, and I'd be writing <laughs> novels and probably, not, probably novels, maybe some history. Three-part question. You can go anywhere in the world. Where do you go? You could take one person you know, and you could take one celebrity. Where do you go? Who do you take that you know and what celebrity? Wow. Well, the person I would take would be my wife, Nora, <laughs> without question. Uh, where I would go... Uh, 
Monaco at the bottom of the Swiss Alps. Okay. And uh, who I would take with me. Does it have to be living? No. <laughs> I guess it has to be living. <laughs> I guess now, yeah. You're going to go, yeah, gonna go with me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'll take Redford. Take Redford. Take Robert Redford. Okay. All right. If you're in it, why him? I think he's a fascinating guy. He's got a lot of different interests and a thoughtful guy, and uh, obviously very good at his craft. Two final questions. If wherever you walked there was a quote that hung above your head that we could all see, what would you want that quote to be? The only constant in life is change. Embrace it. And finally for you, what is one thing, if you had unlimited power, what's one thing that you would want to do to change this world in this moment? What was one thing that you would do, the first thing you would do? Declare peace. Fair enough. That's John Swafford. John, as always, I appreciate it. Good to be with you, Dan. This is a wake-up call, Fast Break. Gear up with the real deal at Dreisig Apparel, creating what people are going to see and learn about you before they even meet you. Gear up for what you need for your team, business, or event. To look professional, look good, and feel good, outfit yourself at DreisigApparel.com. That's D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G Apparel.com. The only place to gear up with the real deal. What's the universal language of a fan? Clapping your hands. With Fan Hands, the ultimate sports fan accessory, find your team color, slip them on, and start cheering on your favorite team with 11 different colors always in stock on FanHands.com, where you'll find the ultimate sports fan accessory. Real fans wear Fan Hands. Utica Pizza Company spells family, your family, my family, their family. The recipes that they have shared with each other throughout the years and have now been so gracious to share them with us. I can sit here and talk with you about all the great things that are on the menu. We'd be here forever. So let me say this. Utica Pizza Company is second to none. And now you can bring it home with you and you can dine in in the restaurant. UticaPizzaCompany.com will give you all the information that you need. And let me say, these Utica Greens... They're the best. Utica Pizza Company. Call them and place your order at 315-214-3060. That's 315-214-3060. Families break bread at Utica Pizza Company. Gear up with the real deal at Dreisig Apparel. Creating what people are going to see and learn about you before they even meet you. Gear up for what you need for your team, business, or event. To look professional, look good, and feel good, outfit yourself at DreisigApparel.com. That's D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G Apparel.com. The only place to gear up with the real deal. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. You can find us on Twitter at CallDT, Instagram at WakeUpCall underscore DT, and on Facebook at WakeUpCallDT. So make sure that you're connecting with us in all ways, and thank you so much for being a part of the broadcast, as always, right here on MixLR.com backslash DT every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And during Championship Week, giving you a bonus show, we'll be on Saturday, March 10th. We'll be on tomorrow. For those of you listening live at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, we'll be with you once again. And we are broadcasting live this week from down in Brooklyn. Wake Up Call with Dan Satora has, is proud to have broadcasted from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, as well as St. Augustine, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, Orlando, Florida. I'm trying to think. I don't want to forget any of the places here. Sh- uh, not Chicago. St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, no, we did do Chicago. Chicago, Illinois. St. Louis, Missouri. Houston, Texas. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. <laughs> we have done... Charlotte, North Carolina, Greensboro, North Carolina, obviously here in Brooklyn, 
So I want to thank everybody for all Washington, D.C. Let me not forget that. Wake Up Call with Dan Satora is, is proud to have broadcasted from so many cities live on location. And, of course, our home of central New York and being there with you every, you know, the, the majority of the year, being there with you and, and broadcasting inside of our studios in central New York. So thank you to all my central New Yorkers as well as to everybody around the country and the world for listening into the show. And thank you to Brooklyn for the hospitality. This is our second year that we have been here for the ACC Tournament and Championship Week in Brooklyn, New York. And I am more than ecstatic and honored and appreciative of being able to broadcast from not only Brooklyn, but this is where my grandmother grew up on my dad's side and Atlantic Avenue where the Barclay Center is where she grew up as well. So on Atlantic, in the BK, doing my show for a company that I own, I would venture to say that if my grandma was here right now, she'd be pretty damn happy. And Grandma, you're a part of everything that I do. And I do it for all of us. I do it for I do it for our family. And I, I just I know if she was here right now she'd say, I'm so proud of you. She'd be proud of me if I picked up a nickel on the on the ground <laughs> and you know, and she'd give me a big hug and she'd go, I love you and I sent it right back to you. So to my gammy, I love you, Gam. And I, I know you're in heaven watching over us. I hope you're having a good day. Hope you're doing well up there. Whatever it looks like. And I hope you can hear me this morning. So I send you a kiss and a hug. And I love you very much. If we're celebrating women, I celebrate you. And you always treat me like uh, your special little boy. That's what she always said. She said, you're my special little boy. Even when I became a man, she she always called me her special little boy. So, happy to be that, Graham. And I love you. And I love you very much. So, God bless you. Always. And and I hope that you're enjoying heaven. And a long, 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 long time after I lived a great life here, continue to live a great life, I should say. I look forward to seeing you. So, and giving you a big hug and a kiss. And hearing you laugh and get going when you laugh and... Hear you say the words the way you said them. I love you. I love you too. So, yeah, we're proud to be here in Brooklyn. Because not only is it awesome, you know, covering the ACC tournament, championship week as a whole, and college basketball in general, but being on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn connects me to the history of my grandmother to a time when she was young and she was coming up. So it's just funny how the world works and somehow brings it all together. So I love you, Grandma. And I'm really happy to represent our family here in the BK and have that Barclay Center covering these games right on Atlantic Avenue. You never let anything stand in front of me and you never let me let anything stand in front of me so we're gonna knock it down together i love you continuing on here with wake up call with dan tortora on mixlr.com backslash wake up call dt want to get into some things uh, as you know for those of you that are on wake up call dt.com you know that i write there what is their article wise right now 500 something that are up there probably close to it All the articles, I write an an article for every single game of the ACC tournament. So every game, every round, you've had stories all the way through this ACC tournament. So we take a look at where we started things here. So uh, Boston College never trails, moves on to face NC State in day two. That was the first story. Notre Dame remains alive in the NCAA tournament discussion. That was also part of the day one conversations and we continue those on with history in the making Syracuse gets first ACC tourney win Cardinals soar above Seminoles comeback try then we have 12th seed at Boston College and ACC tourney final eight Irish live to fight another day Tar Heels get the best of an orange debacle 
and then we got into the stories from yesterday. And I want to go into some of those and, and give you a little recap of what happened in the games yesterday for the ACC quarterfinals. And like I said, you can read these articles. You can read the virtual newspaper from wherever you are by going to wakeupcalldt.com and clicking on the Right Now page, which is a play on words, because whatever I write, you can read it now on demand at your leisure. So make sure you go and do that. And there's a bunch of topics that are there. There's the Atlantic Coast Conference, NCAA, NFL, Jacksonville Jaguars, American Athletic Conference, uh, Syracuse men's basketball, Syracuse football, and so on and so forth. So you can actually click on the category on the right-hand side, and that will take out everything else and just give you that category. So if you just want Syracuse football, you'll have just Syracuse football articles all together. It'll sift through them for you and give you what you're looking for. You know, Syracuse basketball, same type of thing, ACC, so on and so forth. So Virginia locks in a spot in the ACC tourney semis. The Louisville Cardinals were hoping the third time would be a charm, having lost their two regular season games to the Virginia Cavaliers. The latter won by a point after the Cavaliers scored five points in the final point nine seconds with that last second bucket by, or the last half of a second or whatever you want to call it, bucket by DeAndre Hunter of Virginia. Virginia on the other hand, in this game, was looking for the clean sweep versus Louisville and a more convincing win than a last-second heave like in their previous matchup. It was all Cavaliers to begin the game, with the team getting out by as much as 17 points on the Cardinals with about three minutes before the break. Virginia would hold on to a double-digit lead at half by 11, 38-27. But Louisville will not go quietly out of the tournament, surging in the second half to get their deficit down to as little as four points. Following a dunk by freshman forward Jordan Wara with 8.55 left to play in the game, making it 56-52 Virginia had come, uh, making it 56-52 Virginia as Louisville had come all the way back to get this game to a two-possession game. Cavaliers responded, though, with an 8-0 run, which raised their lead back to double digits at 64-52 after a jumper by senior guard Devin Hall with 5.39 to play. Including the 8-0 run, Virginia ended the contest on an 18-6 run en route to a 75-58 victory that advanced them to the ACC tournament semis. Top scorer, top scorer for Virginia was sophomore guard Kyle Guy with 19, followed by Devin Hall with 14. Freshman guard DeAndre Hunter with 12. Sophomore guard Ty Jerome with 11. And sophomore forward Mamadi Diakite with 10. Junior forward Ray Spaulding led all Louisville scorers with 14 points followed by junior forward Dang Adele with 13, and sophomore forward VJ King with 11. So we see that down by 17, Louisville was. They bring it all the way back to 56-52, down by 4, and then the Cavs responded with an 8 nothing run. So you get it to down 4, then the Cavs make that run and branch out to 12. Those are the plays that are done by teams that want to be a champion. I mean, that's what happens. It's a game of runs. And I got to tell you that, especially in the ACC quarterfinals, these teams that look like they were on the ropes made big time runs, just like Virginia did to win that game. In a game of runs, Clemson claws out the W over Boston College. Want to go to a recap of that game from my coverage live here in Brooklyn, New York, where Wake Up Call is hanging out this entire week doing what we do. Basketball is a game of runs. The 12th seeded Boston College Eagles and 4th seeded Clemson Tigers lived up to that statement as soon as the ball dropped. Boston College began the game on a 7-0 run. Clemson, down 12-3, responded with an 8-0 run of their own. After an offensive rebound and tip in by freshman forward Stephon Mitchell of the Eagles, the Tigers would go on yet another run, this one being 7-4, to gain their first lead of the game following senior forward Mark Donnell's three-pointer at the 11.50 mark of the first half that made it 18-16 Tigers. So, Boston College starts out 7-0, Clemson responds with an 8-0, then BC gets, a point, gets another bucket, then the Tigers go 7-4 on a run and get the advantage. So just to look at that and look at how things started, 7-0 here, 8-0 there, then a shot, then 7-4. You know, So you look at what the Tigers are willing to do, and to push back to get up to 18-16, they would extend out to as much as a 14-point lead after trailing 7 nothing to begin the game. Tigers would hold on to the advantage for the final 11 minutes and 33 seconds of the first half, despite the Eagles shrinking the Tigers' lead to 6, 40-34. 
with 147 remaining, off of a free throw by sophomore forward Nick Popovich. It was a three-possession game at the break, 43-36, with Clemson on top of things, essentially making it a tale of two halves of a half. So not a first-half, second-half tale of two halves, but a tale of two halves of a half. First half, not so great. Second half, hello. Clemson stayed healthy on the runs in the second half as well, beginning the second period on a 9-1 run to get out to a 15-point lead, 52-37. Junior guard Jerome Robinson connected from long range to get Boston College within 9, 59-50, with under 10 minutes to go in the contest. Clemson lead was cut to single digits thanks to an 11-4 run by Boston College. That began off of a made free throw by junior guard guard Jerome Robinson with 13.06 left to play in the game. The Eagles would trim their deficit even further when sophomore guard Kai Bowman made both of his free throws inside 7.30 to make it a two-possession game with the Eagles down 61-55. Bowman would not be done, hitting a three to get Boston College within three, 61-58. He came up huge in this game. Then a follow-up three to get them within two, 63-61. But neither would Clemson. As much as Bowman wasn't done, Clemson wasn't either. As junior guard Shelton Mitchell... Moved Clemson back to a double-digit lead with 2.33 to go off of his layup that brought the score to 74-64. So Bowman gets it down to two, and then Clemson goes on another run, and Shelton Mitchell helps the team get up by 10. Bowman would hit two big-time threes inside a minute, but the Tigers continued to answer at the charity stripe with senior guard Gabe DeVoe going four for four. With 27.6 seconds to go, Boston College was within 5, 87-82, after Robinson made two free throws from a dead ball foul, and Bowman attacked the rim on the possession that went with the free throws. But with 23.8 seconds to play, Bowman fouled out. He had 23 points, 8 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 steals, 1 block, and 2 turnovers in the game. DeVoe went back to the line, went 2 for 2 to stretch the Tigers' lead back out to 7 points, and teammate, junior guard Marquise Reed, would add one more freebie to close the game out at 90-82 to advantage Clemson as the fourth seed will move on to face the top seed of Virginia Cavaliers in the ACC semis. Leading the way for the Tigers was DeVoe with 25 points on 8-for-18 shooting from the field, 6-for-6 six six at the charity stripe, followed by junior guard Shelton Mitchell with 21 points. Boston College is led by Bowman and Robinson once again in this tournament, this time Bowman with 23 and Robinson with 20. That was a big-time game. That was a big-time game. Brad Brownell of Clemson and Jim Christian of Boston College, two unsung heroes as coaches inside of the ACC, and the work that they have done with the teams that, that, that they have brought up. I mean, Boston College was at the basement of the basement of the basement of the ACC, and Clemson right there close to them. What Brad Brownell and Jim Christian have done this season to give them both a case to get into the NCAA tournament and definitely Clemson, it's massive. And it cannot go understated. The next one up, Duke has a highlight reel of a game to oust Notre Dame. And like I said, coming up in just a little bit, you will hear from players from each of these games. You'll hear from Virginia's DeAndre Hunter, Devin Hall, and Mamadi Diakite. You will also hear from Mark Donnell and Elijah Thomas of Clemson. You'll hear from Kai Bowman and Jerome Robinson of Boston College, Gary Trent Jr. of Duke, Lonnie Walker IV and Chris Likes of Miami, and Joel Berry II of North Carolina. Getting into this Duke game, Duke with their highlight reel win, everything about the opening of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish versus Duke Blue Devils game screamed classic in the making as they traded buckets back and forth. But it moved into more of a Duke highlight reel than anything else. True freshman forward Marvin Bagley III... (laughs) scored nine points in the first four minutes of the contest. In a span of one minute and 14 seconds from 13.57 to the 12.43 mark, both teams combined to score 14 points. 14 points between the two teams in a span of one minute and 14 seconds. During that time, senior guard Grayson Allen made back-to-back-to-back shots from beyond the arc. With just under 10 minutes to play, the Blue Devils had created a nice cushion with an 11-point lead, 32-21, aided by Allen beginning the game 5-for-5 five five from the field. All three-pointers. 
Then Duke went into a dry spell with no field goals since the 10-10 mark. Notre Dame capitalized by scoring three field goals to get their deficit down to single digits, down eight at 35-27. Fighting Irish would work the ball around. A senior guard, Matt Farrell, dribbled strong down the baseline, kicked it out to junior guard Rex Fluger, who dribbled inside the arc and pulled up for the trigger. Senior forward Bonzi Colson added a jumper to follow, and it was just a four-point lead by the Blue Devils, 35-31. After scoring nine points in the opening four minutes of the game, Marvin Bagley the third went cold following the 16-minute mark of the first half until a free throw broke the drought with nine seconds before the half. With Marvin Bagley having scored at nine points in the first four minutes, did not score after that for a span of 15 minutes and 51 seconds. And that is an important note because he went off in this game. So he starts the game nine points in four minutes then has a drought of 15 minutes and 51 seconds that a free throw breaks. And then I'll tell you in just a moment here what he ended up with. So he has a long-standing drought of almost 16 minutes. Didn't seem to hurt him. At the other end, senior forward Martinez Gebin uh, cleaned up at the rim for Colson, and then Colson fouled with a bucket to bring the Duke lead down to 5, 40, 35. Sophomore guard T.J. Gibbs Jr. would feed sophomore forward John Mooney, who'd throw down some force into the nylon to beat the hands of his defender and the game clock, providing some momentum for the Irish going into the half, fighting down 41-37. With Notre Dame closing in as the first half came to an end, Duke needed to stymie a roll reversal between them and Notre Dame, and they did open the second half. A little over four minutes into the second half, the Blue Devils were on a 10-4 run, getting themselves back to a double-digit lead after only being up four at the half. They got up 51-41 on that 10-4 run. Bagley found the basket early in the second half, just as he did early in the first, accumulating 11 points in the first seven minutes of the second period. He was all smiles after hitting a three that put him over the 20-point threshold at 21 points with more than 13 minutes left to play. Duke continued to pour it on, having an answer for everything. Down 58-45 to after the aforementioned three by Bagley, Fighting Irish would score 21 points by the 409 mark of the second half. But the Blue Devils, already ahead 13, would score 22 points of their own, leaving the Fighting Irish consistently trying to play catch-up. Even a botched alley-oop attempt from Allen to Bagley bounced in off of Bagley at the rim, showing how everything seemed to be working and clicking for Duke in this game. Inside two minutes to play, Colson came off the floor with 18 points, a 9-for-17 shooting, 9 rebounds, 3 steals, 1 assist, 1 block, and 2 turnovers. Then, with just under a minute to go, Farrell's night ended as well after 11 points, 12 assists, so a double-double with assists and points, and 1 turnover in the game. Duke more than handled Notre Dame in this one, gaining a lead at 4-3 to three thanks to a dunk by Bagley at the 18-24 mark and never letting go of it for the final 38 minutes and 24 seconds of the game. Bagley concluded the game with 33 points. See what I mean? He went on an almost 16-minute drought in the first half. Still ends the game with 33 to lead all scorers on both teams. He went 15 for 23 from the field, came down with 17 rebounds for a double-double, 13 of them on the defensive end on his double-double outing. Bagley and Allen combined to score 56 of the team's 88 points, Allen having 23 on the night, 15 of them from beyond the arc. With the victory... The second seed of Duke find, finds themselves back in the ACC men's basketball tournament semis. And setting up the other side of that, UNC began quiet but finished loud en route to the semifinals. The sixth seeded North Carolina Tar Heels, third seeded Miami Hurricanes, open up the ACC men's basketball tournament quarterfinal matchup with a quiet three minutes and change where no one scored. Then at the 1636 mark, Miami was found on the board thanks to a final. It was first on the board thanks to a layup by freshman guard Chris Likes, who you'll just hear from. Who you'll hear from in just a moment. The Hurricanes would get out by as many as a 14-0 lead in the first seven minutes of the game. North Carolina would score their first points at the 1251 mark of the first half, ending a drought of over seven minutes when sophomore guard Seventh Woods completed the old-fashioned three-point play that made it 14-3 Miami. Including the aforementioned p- points by Woods, Tar Heels would go on a 7-0 run of their own to cut their deficit in half at 14-7. With exactly 10 minutes left on the first half clock, sophomore forward Duan Huell banked in a jumper to end the unanswered run by North Carolina. 
Miami and North Carolina would keep it tight from there with the Tar Heels taking their first lead of the game at 1918 off of a three by sophomore guard Brandon Robinson. The Hurricanes responded immediately when senior guard Jaquan Newton rose up for a jumper that gave the lead back to Miami 20-19. For as strong as Miami began the game, however, North Carolina was the one in charge down the stretch, ending the first half on a 32-17 run that placed them ahead of Miami 32-31 at the half. Think about that. Miami started the game 14-0 on North Carolina. North Carolina ended the first half on a 32-17 run to give them a one-point lead at the half. The final moment of the first half was interesting, to say the least. North Carolina had seemingly run time out on a heave that was nowhere close to the basket, but after further review, the officials decided there was a foul on freshman guard Lonnie Walker IV, which we'll talk about in just a moment which placed graduate transfer forward Cam Johnson on the line for three shots. Johnson made all three to give the Tar Heels their 32-31 advantage heading into the locker room. With the first seven minutes of the second half, there were eight lead changes and three ties in the first seven minutes of the second half, a complete opposite of how the first half began with the Tar Heels down 14-0 in the initial seven minutes. The Tar Heels would gain the lead with 12-31 remaining in the game off of a dunk by freshman forward Garrison Brooks that made it 49-47. Out of a break in the action, Walker added a layup and Newton a three on back-to-back possessions for the Hurricanes, getting them within three of the Tar Heels, 66-63. But senior forward Theo Pinson would respond to Newton's deep shot with one of his own, moving North Carolina back out to a six-point advantage. 69-63. He would send a reply message to Miami again on a slam that shook the entire basketball unit with under four minutes to go, a play that gave North Carolina a 71-65 lead. Junior guard Kenny Williams would attack the rim himself for the Tar Heels with back-to-back carbon copy lay-ins that elevated the Tar Heels back to a double-digit advantage, this time at 75-65 with exactly two minutes remaining. With 44.2 seconds left on the game clock, head coach Roy Williams cleared his bench with the Tar Heels ahead, 78-65. Freshman forward Brandon Huffman and senior forward Aaron Rollman each scored for North Carolina, coming off the bench to close out the contest 82-65. So kind of adding insult to injury at that point, when Roy Williams decides to clear his bench of everybody, Huffman and Rollman both score over Miami. Williams put 15 players on the court in this game, and all but three of them scored. Pinson led all Tar Heels at 25 points on 9 for 12 shooting. His 11 rebounds gave him a double-double on the night. Johnson fouled with 13. Williams and senior guard Joel Berry, the second, both had 11. Newton led the way for the Hurricanes with 17 points on 7 for 16 shooting. The only other Miami player in double figures in the game was junior guard Anthony Lawrence, the second, with 12 points. Guess who the Tar Heels draw now in the ACC tourney semis? None other than their forever rival, the Duke Blue Devils. We'll take a quick step aside for a fast break, and when we come back, you will hear from 11 different players in my one-on-one conversations from the ACC quarterfinals here in Brooklyn as Wake Up Call airs live on location in Brooklyn, New York, with the ACC and so much more. This is a wake-up call, Fast Break. Hey, Wake Up Call listeners, this is Tom Taylor, owner of Sammy Malone's, located at 2 Oswego Street in Baldwinsville, New York, overlooking the beautiful Seneca River. We proudly open our doors to you seven days a week, beginning at 11 a.m. daily, with free parking. Whether it's game day, after work drinks, or a meal with family and friends, we are honored that you come visit us. Call 315-635-5407 for parties and catering. I'll see you at Sammy Malone's, home of the best sandwich in Beeville. Hi, this is Domenico Vitale, owner of Giovanni's Formalware, where you look great and feel even better with our renowned tailoring and alteration services on any suit or any tuxedo from anywhere. Call 315-455-8729. That's 315-455-8729. Stop in locally on Route 11 in North Syracuse next to the Ponderosa Plaza. 
where you can choose your style, get fitted, and tailored, all at Giovanni's Formal Wear. I'm George Townsend of Honda City with some good advice from buying a new car. The true cost of owning a new car is determined by the appraised value when you trade it. No vehicle appraises higher than a Honda. Next, look for low APRs and deep discounts. You also want low maintenance costs and great fuel economy. That's why my advice to you is to buy a new Honda. Looking pre-owned, visit our Honda Certified Used Car Center. Honda City, 7140 Henry Clay Boulevard, Liverpool, or hondacity-cny.com. It would be a pity if you don't shop. For all of us that have always wanted our favorite restaurant to come to us, it's now a reality in Central New York with It's a Utica Thing, with Utica Pizza Company bringing their wonderful recipes that they've handed down through generations to you, to your events, to your business, to your home. It's a Utica Thing, proudly bringing Utica Pizza Company on wheels to your location. Call 315-738-8946. That's 315-738-8946 to bring Utica Pizza Company to your doorstep with It's a Utica Thing. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT here with Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora as we broadcast live on location from Brooklyn, New York in my grandma's old stomping grounds of Atlantic Avenue where the Barclays Center is actually at. So, you know, there are no coincidences, only God incidences in life. And isn't it a beautiful thing when I get to come back to where my grandmother grew up to do my job and what I love. So I really do appreciate it. And I want to thank God for all that he has done in my life and kind of bringing things full circle for my grandmother and I. Truly appreciate it. With that being said... It is time to get into the ACC one-on-one conversations from the quarterfinals that I had here on location at the Barclays Center for the ACC tournament. 11 different players coming up right now, and I want to start things off with Miami. And we're going to start it off with Lonnie Walker IV. So Lonnie Walker IV, as I had brought up, you know, they thought the game, I mean, I thought the game was going into the half for Miami and North Carolina. It looked like North Carolina had taken a shot and it was way off. They went back and looked at it and decided that it was a foul on Lonnie Walker the fourth. And so three free throws for Cam Johnson turned an advantage for Miami going into the break into a one-point advantage for the North Carolina Tar Heels. So we're going to get into that and so much more with Lonnie. We're going to start off with just how the team fought but couldn't ultimately get their way back in this game. Um, just typically just the five-second layup. You know, um, we were kind of expecting a couple foul calls, but, you know, that's the love of the game. It's college basketball. you got to grow up. And um, transition-wise, defensively, we wasn't getting back. You know, they had a couple, about six straight points where – we didn't get back defensively on transition, and, you know, they scored off of them, them uh, transition buckets, and, you know, it was mainly just our defensive effort and um, defensive rebound, and we kind of lost sight in that in the second half, and um, it's just a learning experience. You know, we got to regroup, refocus, and we got to worry about this uh, March Madness now. North Carolina is known for being a team that's very well uh, put together when it comes to adjust adjustments. Just what you can say they did to adjust from the first half to the second half, what you saw from them in the second half. Uh, they picked it up. You know, they got two great seniors and Theo Pence and Joel Berry. And, um, you know, they show why they're seniors. You know, they've been here so many times. They know how to play. They know how to play under this uh, conditions. And, you know, they pulled through. You know, Joel Berry, Joel Berry played pretty good. Theo Pence stepped it up. And um, they were the engine of that team. Uh, we just had to pick it up. We had to match the intensity. And tonight we just didn't. Bring me into the end of the first half. The shot goes up. It looks like it's way off. Buzzer hits, and then they go back and look at it, and it's a foul on a three point. You know, are three opportunities at the charity strike for Cameron Johnson. Mm, uh, just a freshman mistake. Just a freshman mistake. I uh, can't be making those type of fouls. Uh, I was very low IQ on myself, and you know, I take total total blame on that one. There's really no excuse for me to foul someone like that with one second left on a half court shot. 
What can you say about this season? I mean, you've had your adversity, you've had your strong moments. What have you learned from the season up to this point? Um, you have your ups and downs, but you got to remain focused and your confidence can't get too high, your confidence can't get too low. You just got to remain focused and uh, play, play to the best of your capabilities each and every game. So, um, you know, I just got to learn from this and be mentally prepared for whatever happens after this. And knowing that the NCAA tournament's on the horizon, just what you could say about where Miami's at right now and what you guys can take away from this and, and use this moving forward. Um, we're in a great place. Uh, this is definitely a humbler moment for us, for us to lose. Um, you know, now we can learn from our mistakes and rebuild, refocus, and rejuvenate. You know, we know what we can do. We know what this team can do. I know what I can do. And uh, we all got to step it up individually and also as a team. Coming once again from Lonnie Walker, the fourth in the game for the Miami Hurricanes, who came up short of the Tar Heels despite starting off the game by getting things going. And the guy that got it going was his teammate, Chris Likes, who got the first bucket of the game for either team. Just what he could say about both st both teams starting quiet in this game. Both of us were really good defensive teams today. Um, for the most part, I think it started out, everything was contested. Neither one of us were hitting shots, so it was a little sloppy. Um, but I just found, I found a gap um, was able to get to the cup. So um, that kind of ignited things for us a little bit on the offense. Then we started getting easier looks. Um, but you got to understand, North Carolina is always going to battle back. Um, and that's what they did. So and we knew that, but I think just a few things didn't go our way today. Um, so... Um, we just didn't make plays down the stretch. Guys in foul trouble. I was in foul trouble, so um, guys didn't really catch a rhythm. But um, you know, we, we just got to be better than that. You broke it open, like you made mention of, in Miami. You know, you guys started out with a 14-0 run in the game before North Carolina got anything going, and then they had a run of their own, 7-0, right. to, to cut the lead in half. Just what you can say about what was going right in the beginning to make such a strike before they struck back? Um, I think it just came down to we were hitting shots, and they weren't. Um, they, were getting, they were getting some good looks, um, shots that we know the guys can make. Um, fortunately, they were missing them, but, you know, basketball is a game of runs, so um, after that, they started hitting those shots. Um, and we just stopped. We stopped. You know, um, sharing the ball, and that's that's on me as a point guard. So um, I just got to be better than that. They finished after starting down 14 to nothing. They finished the first half on a 32 to 17 run. Yeah. Just what you can say about you know what they were doing right. I know you said like some shots weren't falling and they started to fall, but mm -hmm. just what were they doing? How well were they adjusting to maybe what you guys were trying to do defensively? Uh, I mean, you saw they they were pushing the pace. Um, we had Priest in, in the, in the uh, pregame warm-ups. You know, we got to get back. It's going to be a track meet. And, I mean, they, they, it was a track meet for them. We didn't really get back. Um, we just didn't make a lot of, uh, you know, high-energy plays today. Um, I think, I mean, guys were a little, a little anxious, um, especially because you got a lot of freshmen and sophomores um, on this team. It's their first ACC tournament. Um, in an atmosphere like that, I mean, that's expected. So um, I think we just got to watch film. Um, just prepare to be better for that. North Carolina is used to letting a team kind of feel like they can get back into it mm -hmm. and then push them back out. You guys had got it down to two possessions a couple times and got it down to one possession, right. and they just continue to respond, just what you can say. You know, in those moments where you were surging to come back, I know Jaquan had, you know, some big-time moments that just – as a team, right. you were there, but every time you're there, I mean, not just with you, but with a lot of teams, they could pull it out a little bit farther and kind of dangle the mouse in front of you. Uh, like I said, um, they got a lot of seniors on their team, and that, that really shows in, in moments like that. Um, you didn't see they were rattled. They just came down. Even when we were trying to make a run, they just came down, uh, executed their plays. You know, they got really good players. They got a good coach, so um, they got easy layups, easy, easy jump shots, so... Um, I mean, that, it was hard for us to, you know, cut it down to, like we, like you said, one possession. So I think we spent a lot of energy trying to uh, get back into the game, you know, and that's when they opened it up at the end uh, with a lot of fast breaks. You said about having young guys on this team, freshmen and sophomores, at the same, you know, sense of everything. You look at the ACC, 15 schools, and you finished in the top four mm -hmm. of this, at top three right, in right. the ACC standings. Just what that says about the team moving forward into the NCAA tournament and the future of this team, knowing that you got a bunch of young guys and you're already in the top three. Right. Um, I mean, we 
I think we really battled with the circumstances we had with Bruce Brown out. Um, I think we did a really good job. You know, that's a big piece to our team. So um, I think we did a good job coming together. Um, a lot of guys stepped up to the plate. So um, we, we are a young team, like you said. So we got a lot coming back. Um, you know, but right now we're, we're focused on March Madness. You got something to fight for coming up? Oh, uh, definitely. Um, I mean, I didn't. I was in foul trouble today, so I didn't really get to um, leave it all out there on the court like I wanted to. So, um, in March Madness, that's that's something I'm going to do. Like, it's not any excuses for me. Thanks, man. No Appreciate problem. It. That coming once again from Chris Likes of the Miami Hurricanes, who came out on the losing side of things up against North Carolina, who had some nice strikes in this game and ultimately came out with the victory on the other side of this matchup with that victory is Joel Berry the second and this is what Joel Berry and I conversed about after the game I wanted to I wanted to use that (laughs) my head was like use conversed it'll be fun (laughs) so we're going to discuss how the team was down 14 to nothing and was disciplined to come back yeah, uh, like I said, our, our bench guys came in and gave us some great minutes off the bench. And, um, you know, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a team effort. It's not about the five guys that start. Um, you know, it's about the whole team. And so they were they came in and gave us some good minutes. And um, we were able to come back in and, and uh, take on that. But um, they did a great job of coming in and helping us out. Look at kind of moving forward here. Just what you could say you've learned from some of the games this season and some of the adversity that you guys have had because you're able to stave off a lot of pushes by other teams and typically be on the right side of things. Yeah, um, I mean we can see that we can be down and still be able to compete and get back. And um, like I said, it, it just took a team effort. But going through these times, uh, you never know. You might get down the road and, and be in another situation like this. So it was good that our, our bench guys got in and, and gave us some good minutes. And um, like I said, if we get to this point again, we, we, we know what to do. From the Miami-North Carolina game, we're going to Tarantino this thing and go backwards. So we started with the last game. I started with conversations, one-on-one conversations, here this morning on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, live on location in Brooklyn, New York for championship week in the ACC men's basketball tournament. We started with the last game, as far as interviews go, with Lonnie Walker the fourth and Chris Likes of Miami, Joel Berry the second of North Carolina. So we're going to go to the game before that and to Duke, Notre Dame, and my conversation with Gary Trent Jr. is going to be the next one up here on the broadcast. Gary Trent and I had the opportunity to speak for the first time ever. It's the first time he's ever been on the show. And just what he could say about after taking a 4-3 to three lead as a team for the final 38 minutes and 24 seconds, Duke never trailed Notre Dame. Yeah, simply that we, we started to play together. We were acting about 2-3 zone, and we kept going hard. We rebounded, and we made plays on offensive end as well. Marvin Bagley, just what you could say about what he's been. I mean, he got started early in the first half, early in the second half, ends the game with 33 points. Just what you could say about what he does with this team, what type of dynamic he brings to this. Man, it's phenomenal. He, he, he's crazy. A mismatch nightmare. He, he can't be stopped, and I feel bad for whoever has to guard him. Uh, he, he's a he's a terrific player, even a better person, and I'm glad he's on our team. Grayson Allen starts off five for five from long range. Just what you could say about you know his efforts as well. Yeah, Grayson got up to a hot start. He was phenomenal as well. He got us going, and Marvin ended it for us. Multifaceted, multidimensional on offensive defense. Just what you could say about you know where you guys are at right now. I know you said you're surging late right now. Yeah, we've been we've been good as late as right now, and we continue to get better every game. And it's the postseason now, so we just got to get with it and, and suck it up and play hard. When it comes to the ACC tournament, even with all these old Big East schools getting added to it over the years, Duke's always there. Just what you can say about the longevity and what it means for you. Simply just the, the program, the system, it works, and it's been nothing but successful. That's right. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay. That coming once again from Gary Trent Jr. of the Duke Blue Devils and continuing the Tarantino to go to the game before that as we go backwards. So the first game of the day was Virginia-Louisville, then BC Clemson, then Duke-Notre Dame, then Miami-North Carolina. But interview-wise, here on the one-on-one conversations this morning, we're doing the Tarantino style. So you heard from the Miami-North Carolina game, the Duke-Notre Dame game, and now we go back to the Clemson-Boston College game. I'm going to start things off with Kai Bowman of Boston College. We'll start off with the team that is heading out of the tournament. 
BC, who had a strong performance in the tournament, definitely has made a case for themselves on getting to the NCAAs. We're going to start with Kai Bowman fouling out after going to the rim and getting a big-time bucket following the free throws by his teammate Jerome Robinson. Kai Bowman fouls out. We're just going to go back to that play and go from there. Uh, I knew that me fouling out was a big part of the game, but also just trying to maintain the motivation to uh, keep my teammates in and let them keep playing through it. You When you're in a position like that, I mean, you, you obviously have to foul to stop the clock, and sometimes it comes down to you. Just what you could say about going back into that play and into that moment where you sacrifice yourself, so to speak. Uh, uh, we were trying to get a trap in the corner. He got out of it, so I thought I thought I didn't hit him. I, I thought I hit the ball, but I mean, rest it different, but uh, it was end of my call, so it's and how he played. You and Jerome have led the way throughout this ACC tournament for the team and it came up a little bit short in this one. Just what you could say about your run in this ACC tournament? Um, just just the loyalty, not just from this year, but from Jerome freshman year. He, he suffered a lot, a lot and we suffered a lot together last year. So us trying to build off of that came in with confidence this year and just wanted to change everything around. The locker room, even despite the loss, you guys seem like their spirits are still positive. Some smiles going on and, and whatnot. Uh, here inside the locker room right now. Just what you could say about that. I mean, you guys aren't hanging your heads after this one. Uh, just nobody understands what we've been through these uh, last year and the year before that. Just uh, nobody's behind us, so we got ourselves to be for be here for. So everybody's together, and we just got to stay together as one. Do you feel like you've done enough to prove yourself to the committee at this point? I feel like just I've been doing what I've been doing the whole time, and whatever it takes, I'm going to just keep doing it. What can you say about whatever happens with the NCAA? Play tournament, just how this season has shown a new era, a new chapter, even a new book potentially for Boston College. Uh, it just showed the loyalty of the players. Just not only uh, Coach been telling us the whole all year uh, confidence and believing, and that's what we come to do, uh, believing in the team. So this has just been helping us uh, on the way to our victories and the way to success. Coach Christian, just what you could say about what he's done for this team, you know, from the outside looking in, doesn't always get a ton of respect, doesn't always get put out there in the national spotlight, but he's obviously done something very special with the team this year. Uh, love him. Uh, he's great, great coach. Uh, he's been looking looking towards everybody, uh, helped everybody out individually and on the team. Uh, and also, um, he's got belief in us just as we got belief in the team, and he helps us believe. What's the biggest thing he's done for you? Uh, just help me understand the ball strain situations and understanding uh, me as personnel, but also understand uh, changing me to a man off the court. That coming from Kai Bowman of the Boston College Eagles here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora in my one-on-one -on -one conversations with these gentlemen from the ACC tournament every single round. Coming up next is Jerome Robinson, teammate of Kai Bowman, and what he had to say about the team starting off 7 to nothing, getting out to a 12 to 3 lead, but ultimately losing the game. Just what he can say about at least how the team had started off and the surge that they made against the higher seeded Clemson Tigers. Yeah, um, I mean, it shows how much heart we have and uh, how much we believe as a team. Um, we started off the run, we knew, we knew we were here to battle. We knew it was going to be a battle. I mean, ranked opponent, really good team. And um, I mean, it was tough down the stretch. We had some good looks at the end that we, we know we can make. And um, I think we'll make them in the future. I think we have a full season. We made a good resume, and we'll be all right. It's a game of runs, and you guys tried to make one late there in the game. Just what you could say about condensing. I mean, they had, they had gone up. They had yeah. found some comfort in a double-digit lead, and yeah. you knocked it down a, a few times, you know, whether it be your shots or with Kai and, you know, the rest of the squad. You guys did what you needed to do to make the game interesting down the stretch. Yeah. Um, as you see in the tournament, there's in this tournament, you know that there's no uh, no safe leads. I mean, BT just gave up a lead last night, and uh, I mean, we knew we knew it was just a matter of time for us to get hot, and uh, we started getting hot towards the end, and then uh, ended up ended up shoring it out on us. But it, it was all right. As much as you guys had made the run, it seemed like you know obviously some of those shots that were falling in previous games were not falling down. Was there any frustration going down the stretch? The thing is, like you really can't get frustrated, you know. You're just on to the next shot, or, or you're gonna be thinking about the next shot, you know. Yeah. So uh, just taking it shot by shot. I mean, we, we all of us are gonna take the open looks that we took 
and we all believe that we can make those open looks. So it's just it's just believing in your shot and, and taking them when you got. There was a dead ball foul. You make two free throws, and Kai comes in and, and gets that layup, and then fouls yeah. out right after that. Just what you could say about yeah, after Kai fouled out of the game. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, he got he got hot towards the end, and um, I mean we, we knew somebody else had to step up, and so um, I came down, missed, missed a couple of shots, but I mean it's part of the game. That was going. It's a whole different ball game. We, we, we're probably being the winner in the locker room. So uh, it's tough. It's tough down the stretch when you, when you can't lock down those shots, but it, it's it's part of the game. Yeah. You're a 12 seed. You made it into the quarters, and you made this game very interesting and, and a push to try to get to the semis. Yeah. Has Boston College done enough? I, I think we made an, uh, we've done enough for some kind of postseason. Um, I think I think we believe that that we have, and, and uh, I think that our, our wins. Well, we have some quality wins, and, and that. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll, we'll just see what, what the committee thinks, you know. It's it's tough, but, um, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely see. Hopefully soon. If they make you a number one seed in the NIT, and it's not the NCAA tournament, but you're at the top of the NIT, what are your thoughts on that? Um, hey, at least we get to play. We get, we get to live another day. So, um, we'll, we'll take it We'll take it for what it is, and we'll just build on it, and then go win that one. That's what we'll be going for. Coach Christian, just what you can say he's done for you and what he's done for this team. Yeah, he's, he's done so much for us. I mean, he's he believes in every one of us. He loves it. He loves us. And uh, I mean, it's it's tough to see that we. I mean, we wanted to win for each other just as much as we want, want it for him. So uh, he's very important to all of us, definitely. This game had Christian up against Brownell, and I mean, these are two guys that don't get the respect that they deserve, and have worked very hard to put BC on the map and to put Clemson on the map. Just what you could say. Obviously, you want to be on the winning side of things, but when you look at these coaches and you look at your team and you look at Clemson on the other yeah. side. You're essentially working to change the ACC. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they came in and, and done a lot so far. You see what Clemson did. They had a tough year last year, but ended up battling back and, and making their run this year. So that's what we're hoping to do. And and, and Coach believes in, and he's, he's instilled the vision. I think both coaches have done done a great job of just recruiting and, and getting guys in to fit their system and, and things like that. So it's uh, I, I mean, much respect to, to Barnell and uh, and to Christian. I mean, they they've done an amazing job so far. On the other side of that matchup for Clemson and Boston College, Mark Donnell and Elijah Thomas coming up next. Mark Donnell, his three off the bench, just what he can say about plays like that that create some momentum for the Clemson Tigers that ultimately played off of it and won the game. Yeah, that's my job, and that's what I'm capable of doing is coming off the bench and trying to be a spark. And, um, you know, I'm a threat from the, the three point line, so that's, that's, that's what I do. So when they get the opportunity for me to get me the ball, and I'm, I'm going to shoot it and you know, hope it goes in. When you have, you know, like you said, a role on this team, just what you can say about how, if you if you feel everybody on Clemson this season's really fit into their roles and fit into their places? Yeah, I mean,. <clears throat> this team is extremely unselfish. You know, everybody has a, a winning mindset. Um, you know, everybody's really happy for each other's success. So, you know, those, those are the best teams to be around and the most fun teams to play on. When you look at <clears throat> this game where Boston College came out seven to nothing, then was up twelve to three. I mean, this is a game of runs back and forth. Just what you can say about staying poised as a team and taking that advantage, holding on to it. Yeah, and we, I mean, we've seen them get hot. You know, at their place, we were up 20-something in the first half, and they were able to come and bring it back. So, you know, they're a team that can get hot at any moment. So we just had to stay poised and you know, take it one possession at a time, and that's all you really can do in, in games like this. You look at the fact that uh, you guys were in the top four inside of the ACC standing, so you obviously didn't have to play the first couple rounds. But still, you know, there's the respect for the Dukes and, you know, Miami and Virginia and whatnot, North Carolina. Do you still feel like there's a chip on the shoulder at Clemson, even though you're in the top four? Yeah. Um, you know, this is a team that you know, we, we feel like we can win every game. And um, going out, that, that's our goal. We, you know, we got a championship mindset, and every single day we're going to compete. And and, you know, give it all on the floor. In the last game of the regular season, you take a loss to Syracuse inside the Carrier Dome. Just what you can say about the bad taste in your mouth and turning that around here in the ACC tournament. Yeah, you, know, you never want to end a regular season on a bad note like that. Um, you know, we felt like we were a better team, and, you know, unfortunately the ball didn't bounce our way um, you know, down the stretch, but, you know, it's, it's a game that we've learned from, and I think that we're better because of it. That coming from Mark Donnell once again of the Clemson Tigers who hit a big three off the bench for the team. Going over to Elijah Thomas, 
Thomas, pardon me, is Clemson's response to Boston College. Just what he can say about how BC started off 7-0 run, up 12-3, and Clemson found a way to respond time and time again to get this victory. This is what Elijah Thomas had to say. Oh, we, uh, like I told everybody else, it's uh, this thing we, we buy stuff by called Clemson Grit, and that's uh, coming out and playing hard every possession, uh, doing the little things that allow us to win the games, and that's what we came out and we did. And with that, that allowed us to win this game. When you see, and I spoke with one of your teammates about it, I spoke with Mark about it, the regular season ended with a loss to Syracuse inside of the Carrier Dome. Just taking that bad taste in your mouth and turning it into something else here in the ACC tournament, how did you maybe use that game as momentum? Uh, every loss we use is momentum. Our coaches, they do a really good job of explaining to us why we lose games. and We go out the next time we practice and execute things we did bad to correct those. And We feel like every time we step on the court, we have a chance to win because they prepare us so well. So what we normally do is when we lose, we, uh, we learn from it, put it in our back pocket, and try to execute the mistakes that we uh, made previously. Mark spoke about how he feels everybody's kind of fallen into their role on this team pretty well. Just what you can say about that if you feel that each guy kind of knows what he needs to do at this point. Oh, for sure. Like I told uh, all these other guys, uh, our freshmen, they do an amazing job. Mark does an amazing job. Um, our five does an amazing job. Dante, not being able to play, but still leading off the court, does he does an absolutely amazing job. Even our coaches, you know, they uh, they do an amazing job. Like I said, just preparing us to do great things out on the court. And with that, you, you have a chance of being really successful every time you step out. Even though you guys made it into the top four in the standings and didn't have to play the first two rounds of the ACC tournament, do you still feel like there's a chip on your shoulder when it comes to Clemson because there's always conversation about Duke and about North Carolina, conversation about Virginia this season? Do you still feel like there's a chip there? Most definitely. There's a chip on our shoulder because we beat a lot of good teams this year. You know, we were ranked for a couple of weeks straight, and the teams we played that weren't ranked, you know, they wanted to beat us, the teams that were ranked, but necessarily needed wins against us to like get higher in the Standings and the RPI polls and all that other uh, things that like matter for the postseason tournament. You know, we always feel like we have a chip on our shoulder. The main chip is on our shoulders because of where we were picked this year. Uh, I think we were picked 12th or 13th in the uh, ACC to begin with. So we want to just come out and show people that you know we're going to work hard and prove people wrong. And I think that's what we're doing so far. And when you look at that being picked down there, and you know, in recent years, you haven't been in the the top half of the ACC. Right. What was it about this season? What has it been about this season that things just have clicked and the team has done more this year than, than obviously people anticipate. I think the players that are older are uh, maturing. I think the young guys do a really great job of uh, being experienced early. You know, we had the whole Spain trip, so we got to um, gel as a team early and um, understand roles and how we want to play. And those young guys do a really good job of pushing us in practice. You know, we had scrimmages this year where they were beating us at times, and we had to, like, you know, come back. And that allowed us to, like, gel as a team. And with that, like, we can do really good special things. Every few years, you know, like you had mentioned, you got an opportunity to go to Spain every few years. Division One teams get an opportunity to go somewhere and get some extra games in, some, something under your belt before you start off in the season. Just what you can say about the trip to Spain, what it did for you, and just what that's meant to the team this year. Oh, it was amazing. The Spain trip was everything to us because we got to, like I said, jail. We got to spend time um, Together outside of basketball, even the event that happened down there, we got to like you know come together as a team and understand that we all need each other at all times. So um, I think that trip was perfect for everybody. And then as far as Brad Brownell, just what you can say about what he's done on this team and, and what he's meant to you guys moving forward. Oh, he's an incredible coach. He's an incredible coach because he's taught me things that I didn't know. Playing, uh, I've been playing basketball since I was five. Coming here, he taught me so many good things. I never played defense in high school, and I made all defensive team because you just, you know, you just buy into what he says, and he's strict to his plan. And his plan always works. So he's an absolutely amazing coach, and I mean, it shows with what he's done with these young guys. Some of these young guys were recruited by these other schools, and AJ Oliver hasn't played in like 12 games, and he comes out and he plays really good. So Amir Sims, uh, Malik Williams, Scott Spencer, even Mark Donnell leaving Mark Michigan and coming here. I mean, his work shows for itself. So, appreciate it. I appreciate it. That coming once again from Elijah Thomas of the Clemson Tigers as the Clemson Tigers move on to face 
the Virginia Cavaliers in the first of two games in the semifinals from down here as Wake Up Call broadcast live from Brooklyn in the ACC tournament. We'll take our final fast break of the show and come back with those Virginia Cavaliers in just a moment. This is a Wake Up Call Fast Break. The Pennant Trophy Center on 111 East Willow Street in Syracuse, New York, has been making memories for Central New York for over 60 years. It has the trophies for your teams, and when you walk in there, it's so much more than just that. When you walk into the Pennant Trophy Center, you are immersed in the reality that anything can be customized, anything can be engraved, whether it's for your anniversary, your wedding, your bar mitzvah, your birthday party, whatever you want to do with that memory, that watch from grandpa, or that bracelet from mom, or that wedding ring that's been passed down through your family. If you want to get something engraved with a memory to last a lifetime, the Penn and Trophy Center, 111 East Willow Street in Syracuse, New York, where memories are made and where memories last a lifetime. Hi, this is Kira from Looking Glass Events, where we're always giving you a reason to celebrate. Whether you have a small business, large business, personal event, or wedding, we are available to plan and coordinate your dream event to life. Every detail, every step, Looking Glass Events is working with you all the way. Call us at 315-702-4653. That's 315-702-4653. Or contact us through our website, lgweddingsandevents.com. Looking Glass Events giving you a reason to celebrate. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is located on 3680 Milton Avenue in the Home Depot Plaza. It is your family-friendly sports bar and restaurant. Folks, some sports bars aren't family-friendly. Some family-friendly restaurants are not sports bars. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is proud to be both. It is that marriage that you've been looking for for years. The Wildcat Sports Pub is your home base for your sports bar and restaurant needs, games for the kids, indoor and outdoor activities, and enough things on the menu to come back every single week and get to try something new. They're open Sundays from noon to 8 p.m., Monday through Wednesday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Thursday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to midnight. For reservations and party information, call 315 315- 487-2222 for the Wildcat family-friendly sports pub and restaurant. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora is live from the BK down here in Brooklyn, broadcasting live from the BK, doing some good things in the stomping grounds of my grandmother. God bless, Grandma. I love you, Gammy. And I will always be your special little boy. So thank you for all the love and thank you for all the wonderful memories that you gave to me. And I'm so very honored and appreciative to be here. And God works in very mysterious but purposeful ways to get me into your stomping grounds and to be here in Brooklyn For the second year in a row, both times ACC tournament, championship week time, but bringing me here to Brooklyn and bringing me to Atlantic Avenue where the Barclays Center is, where you grew up. So I love you, Grandma. I love you very much. Gammy. She loves being called Gammy. Can't call her Grandma. Got to call her Gammy. So I love you, Gam. God bless you. And may we take a moment here. I'm going to take a moment before we get into the Virginia interviews. Just going to ask you to appease me for a moment. Let's take a moment. Close our eyes. If you're driving, don't close your eyes. (laughs) Take a moment. If you're performing surgery, don't close your eyes. But thank you for listening to the show while you perform surgery because that means that I comfort you. Close your eyes for a second here. And think about one thing that you feel blessed to have today. Ready? Go. I'm thankful that I woke up this morning. I'm thankful that I have my family. Thankful that I have my friends. I'm thankful that I have my business. I'm thankful that I do what I love every day. I'm thankful to have great angels in heaven watching over me, although I miss them terribly. And I'm thankful to have my health. So, be thankful. Coming up next here to round out today's show, 
as we go a little bit over 11 o'clock because we love you. So in order to finish up the show the right way, we have 11 conversations from the quarterfinal round. And I want to continue those on here. So you've heard from Mark Donnell, Elijah Thomas of Clemson, Kai Bowman, Jerome Robinson of BC, Gary Trent Jr. of Duke, Lonnie Walker the fourth, and Chris Likes of Miami, and Joel Berry the second of North Carolina. It's now time to hear from the trifecta of Virginia, DeAndre Hunter, Devin Hall, and Mamadi Diakite. So we're going to start things off with DeAndre Hunter staying poised, even though the lead was shrunk to four when Virginia was facing off against Louisville. Uh, that's that's what we're, uh, that's what we do. Uh, we try not to panic when stuff like that happens. We know there's a lot of game left, and good teams are always going to make runs. So we just have to. I mean, we just have to embrace that and just go on our own run after that. Bring me into sustaining that run and just what you guys, you know, had to do and, and offensively, just what you, what kind of the mindset was at that point. Uh, we just we just had to do what we usually do. Uh, we set good screens on offense, and guys like Kyle and Ty they hit great shots, and Mamadi was scoring in the post. And on defense, we just had to get back to what we do and pack them and force them to hit tough shots. They call the Virginia style of play very frustrating to teams around the country. Just what you could say about being that frustrating team that's going to wear you down. Uh, we embrace that. Uh, we know guys. We don't. We don't even like guarding in practice. So, and that's not even for a whole game. So I know guys don't don't want to guard that for two halves. So I mean, once we see guys get frustrated, that's when we really attack. To speak uh, onto the de- you know into the defense. Just what you could say about some of those key pieces of that frustration. Some of those nuances within the defense, like you said. You're like going up against it in practice? Uh, it's just sometimes there's just no openings. It seems like there's no openings in our defense. And when it, that's tough to go against, uh, all game, go against that all game where you have to hit a tough shot over someone's hand. And that'll just eventually wear you down and just just don't want to play anymore. When you look at Tony Bennett and just what he's been to this program, just what you could say about him as a head coach, he said going into the season that there were question marks. There were guys transferring out, guys that finished up their eligibility. And obviously, yeah, you know, new guys coming in. Just, just what you could say about how he's handled the culture and just what he's done as a leader. Uh, he's great. Uh, he's, he's a great coach. Uh, he's a great leader, a great mentor. I mean, he, he teaches us everything. Uh, he teaches us to take everything one at a time, and we just have to, when it's game time, we just have to be ready. So, I mean, he gets us ready in, in practice, before the games, and he's just, overall, he's just a great guy. When I think of Virginia, I think of the term discipline. Mm-hmm. Just go into that a little bit. Yeah, uh, uh, that's what he teaches you from day one. Uh, if you're not disciplined, you're probably not going to play. And, and once you are disciplined, you still have to become more disciplined. So, I mean, once you once you learn everything, and just have to take it in and keep learning from them. You guys have won a lot of games, uh, close close net games. And one of the games was against Louisville the second time around this season, five points in point nine seconds. Have you ever been a part of a game like that where in less than a second there's five points on the board for your team? No, that was that was the craziest game I ever been a part of. Uh, I don't even think I ever saw a game crazier than that. Maybe the championship from last year in college, but or two years ago. But that was that was a crazy game to be a part of. It's what it says about you know your team and what you guys have done this season that you can gut out those close. I mean, obviously you get big time victories and get separation, but in those close knit games, more often than not, you've gotten the best of the other two. Uh, yeah, we we know we're gonna get that best shot. Uh, <laughs> we just have to we just have to embrace that and we just uh, just play, just play. And then moving forward from here, just what you could say about what's to come here in this ACC tournament and then moving forward in the NCAAs? Uh, we're just looking forward to get get wins. Uh, we don't want to go home early. We want to uh, play in the championship. We want to get as many wins as possible. So we're going, we know we're going to play against tough competition. We just have to get ready for that and go towards it. Lastly, for me, just what you could say about mentorship, just some of the guys that have kind of brought you up on this team. Uh, definitely Devin. Uh, I talk to Devin a lot. Uh, Zay definitely, definitely helps me as well. And those guys, they've been here for so long. They know they don't know almost everything, so just learning from them is probably the best for me. That coming once again from DeAndre Hunter, who hit the big time shot against Louisville with .9 seconds left. The team scored five points, including that last second heave off the backboard by DeAndre Hunter for Virginia to win the game by a, a point in Louisville at the KFC Yum Center. They come back in this one and win it handily to head into the semis of the ACC tournament as a number one seed. Coming up next is Devin Hall about having poise as well when the team was up by four. Uh, we've been in that spot before. I think, um, you know, knowing that you've been in that spot before helps you, you know, when, if you ever, you know, 
to, we're able to be in that situation again. So, you know, keeping our poise and relaxed and uh, knowing that, I mean, basketball is a game of runs. Being in that position before, more often than not this season, you've been able to get the best of the other team on the other side. Just what you could say about, you know, gutting it out in these close games that come down to two, Walk, three points. Yeah, walking in each and every game, you know you can get everybody's best shot. So it's just a, you know, a certain mental aspect. you got to come in with the right focus, man. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that speaks to our toughness as a group coming in and knowing that we, we got to gut some out, two, one point, two, three, whatever. You know, how many, however many points it's going to be, just gutting them out. You've had leaders that have helped you come Come up, and now you are a leader on this team, helping other guys come up. Just what you can say about that transition, and just what you learned from the people before you, and what you're trying to do right now. I mean, I, I could speak about so many different people on this on that have been this, been through this program who helped me, but um, I can't. You know, just the you know the poise you have in the experience. I think you can't take anything away from that having the poise and experience, and uh, you learn every single day. Learn lead by example, lead by you know word of mouth, and just trying to you know put your best foot forward and trying to make sure guys are following the right way. And if they're not, I mean, we have other guys on this team will lead by example you guys don't even see but Ty's a heck of a leader um, at, the, at the point guard position and we, I mean we trust him just like we trust Isaiah Jack or myself. Tony Bennett had said at the beginning of the season with guys transferring out guys finishing their eligibility new yeah. faces coming in that he didn't really know what to expect from this team and that it was going to be a challenge yeah. did you expect this season to go as well as it has so far in yeah I got that question a lot actually um, I mean I, I trust in this program I trust in what we do and how we play and I'm trusting in the guys that so that we have here so to be honest, man, I, I've always had the utmost confidence in this group. So, uh, man, uh, yeah, I guess so, man. I, 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 I love playing here, and this this the system helps us helps us win. Honestly, for me, two things, two words that describe this team: frustrating, yeah, and discipline. Just what you can say to expand on those. That's exactly. I mean, that's exactly what it is. I mean, when you, when you're when you're when the clock, shot clock is boiling down and it gets to five four, and the team's just jacking up shots and it's in the side of the backboard or whatever. I mean, that that, that gives us more. Momentum. That gives us energy, but it's frustrating for them because they know that every possession they're going to have to go against that. So, and in a discipline, you have to be disciplined in, in this uh, in this uh, system because one subtle breakdown can mess the whole thing up. That coming once again from Devin Hall of the Virginia Cavaliers. It's crazy to see how these guys, you know, just come up in their programs from being guys that are playing two minutes role players and whatnot off the bench. Devin Hall was one of those guys for Virginia. Joel Berry II was one of those guys for North Carolina. And here they are in the final four of the ACC tournament. And without Joel Berry and without Devin Hall, these teams don't look like themselves. So it's pretty amazing to see just how how much, you know, from Washington, D.C. just a couple of years ago to being here for the second year in Brooklyn over that time span of the last three seasons just to see Devin Hall's growth as a member of this team and the growth of his role on the team as well, for Virginia as well as for Joel Berry II of North Carolina. Coming up next here is Mamadi Diakite. Had a lot of fun speaking with Mamadi, and we're going off of that conversation that we had with Devin Hall about when I think of Virginia, I think of two words, frustrating and disciplined. What does Mamadi have to say about that? Frustrating for the opponent because of our de defense and discipline because of our offense too. I mean, it can go both sides, but to me, that's what I see because we make them people. We make we make people uh, defense uh, other team uh, worn out of uh, defensively, so we can get the shot we want. So offensively, they're not able to get what they want. Plus, uh, how we deal, how we pack everything. Do you get a sense of that? Do you get a kind of feel for it in the air when a team's starting to get frustrated or uncomfortable? Can you sense that? I mean, everyone can see that. They get mad when they're not able to score the open shot they, t they take because they know they're not going to, they might not have as, as many as those, another chance, I'm saying. So uh, you can see it on the face, even the coaches, how they act after <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, the players shoot. When we see Virginia's defense and yeah. from the outside looking in, there's a lot of respect for it. People talk about it all over mm -hmm. the country. What can you say about being within it? What is it about the preparation of this defense that makes it as great as it is? It's all mental, I think. It's, it's the mental part of it. You gotta understand, and you gotta understand how what you're supposed to do and what is. Other, the others are super, what others are supposed to do in order to to act like a un, like a unit, so you move together. You know, it's like a squad. 
so we move together defensively. And if someone stretches, you can see if someone stretches too much, that's when other teams are able to like get something out of it. But if they don't, if they do not get anything out of it, that's when they get frustrated because it doesn't really happen often. You know, it's, no one can get it perfect. That's why I'm, I'm also saying like no one can get it perfect. You cannot always be on the right spot. Yeah. But you help anyway, however much you can. DeAndre said to me that the defense is so frustrating to him that you guys don't like to practice against it. No, each other. no, 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 we don't. <laughs> you, you can be the most skilled person. And it's really hard to play against it. The only person who was actually able to not get through the defense, but was able to get something out of it was, uh, he's not here right now, but it's Malcolm. You know, very smart player, knows what he's doing. So he was the only one my first year I've uh, seen him. But like, I think we have a different team right now. Yeah. Where I, I feel, and I feel like each, every year, that we get more united. We we serve each other m much more than we used to. And the coaches and the staff, the, the staff is really good at doing that, at inserting that in, in us, you know. Tony Bennett had said at the beginning of the season that he didn't know what was going to happen. He said, you know, this was going to be a, a new type of challenge with guys transferring out as well as you know, guys finishing up eligibility, new faces coming in. Just what you can say about what you've done this season and if you saw that this team could get to this point or if there's something you just kind of learned over time. Well, we never know what's going to happen. We, after that happened, you know, of course, you're someone who really takes care of each step. And so that's what we've been doing since the beginning of this season or since those people left. And we got to a point where we're, not, we're still not comfortable. We're not to a point where we want to be. But we're getting there slowly. I think if once we get there, it's going to be really hard to score on us. So you don't think you're there yet? I, I don't think no none of us think we're there exactly there yet. We're getting there. Slowly. No. And, and lastly for me, Tony Bennett's a personality, so are you. Who has the better personality? I'm Tony, between Tony Bennett and me? Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to have a challenge. <laughs> I don't know right now. I think, I mean, I'll, I'll always go for myself. I, <laughs> especially because of, you know, because I'm African. In Africa, we're really, you know, sweet. Right? I say in Africa, we're really sweet. Or you haven't been to Africa yet? Okay, you need to, you need to go. I'll invite you. Okay. <laughs> That coming once again from Mamadi Diakite of the Virginia Cavaliers. And that will conclude today's broadcast. We were looking to have Terrence Roberts on the broadcast, and unfortunately he couldn't be with us this morning last minute. So, you know, Terrence is no stranger to the show. He's been on here a ton of times, and we look forward to having him back very, very soon and in our best to Terrence Roberts. I want to thank everybody that was a part of the broadcast today. I want to thank DeAndre Hunter, Devin Hall, and Mamadi Diakite, who you just heard from of the Virginia Cavaliers. I'd like to thank Mark Donnell and Elijah Thomas of Clemson, as well as B. C's Kai Bowman and Jerome Robinson, Duke's Gary Trent Jr., Lonnie Walker IV, and Chris Likes of Miami, and North Carolina's Joel Berry II. I also want to put a big, 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 big thank you to the ACC as well as to the commissioner, John Swafford, Amy Acola, and the entire team with the ACC for how well they've treated me over the last five years and change. And I want to thank John Swafford, the ACC commissioner, for sitting down with me today for significant sound bites. I also want to thank Carvel DeWitt for nine years and counting of the annoying moment of the week. God bless, be well, and we hope you swipe right on Wake Up Call with Dan Satora. But even more so, we hope that you come up and talk with us. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go listen to the beginning of the show. It's not just about swiping right. It's about shaking hands, building conversation, and building relationships to last a lifetime. We hope that we have the, these here with you today and always, and you definitely have them from us. God bless you, be well, and remember... Wake Up Call is Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 a.m., but this week, because it's Championship Week, Selection Sunday's coming up, and I'm live from Brooklyn. We're doing an extra day. So we will be with you Saturday, March 10th at 9 a.m. Eastern Time with plenty to come from the ACC Tournament, Championship Week, My Bracketology, as well as interviews with Hal Cohen and Sonny Spira of the Syracuse Orange Basketball History. It's all coming up on Saturday, March 10th, so don't forget to set your dials and Remember the bonus show of Wake Up Call, live on location from Brooklyn, New York, this week, coming up on Saturday, March 10th. In the meantime, God bless, 
be well, and find me on Facebook at Wake Up Call DT, on Twitter at Call DT, and on Instagram at Wake Up Call underscore DT. Get your tickets now for the CNY Pop Festival by going to cnypopfestival.com. That is cnypopfestival.com, as well as cnypopfestival.eventbrite.com if you'd like to go there. That's where our tickets are at, or you can go to cnypopfestival.com, and it will redirect you to the Eventbrite site when you click on Buy My Tickets Now. There are a limited quantity of VIP tickets as well as the May the 4th Be With You sale, which gives you a child admission for free with every adult purchase. So you purchase an adult ticket, you get one child free ticket. So make sure that you do that today on cnypopfestival.com. Looking forward to talking with you very soon. God bless. And thank you to Hot 107.9, Kobe, and his podcast and everything that he does for having Myself and Al Kutry on to speak on the CNY Pop Festival. Check it out by going to Kobe's stuff on social media at Kobe on the radio and looking for the link there and listening into our podcast about the CNY Pop Festival. In the meantime, God bless, be well, and make sure you stay close to wakeupcalldt.com as well as all the social media that I just gave you to connect with the ACC tournament semifinals and so much more. Semis coming up tonight and the finals on Saturday. I'll talk with you very soon. God bless, be well, and be good to yourself.